There was a running joke in my family for many years. It was always the ladies who said it. Never the men. As if the guys were in on some secret the women didn't know about. There goes the werewolf, my mother and aunts would say, as my grandpa was going out the door, hat in hand. He always disappears on full moons, never comes back until the morning. As children, we would laugh along with them, not understanding the true reasons for his leaving. The years went on and my grandfather, who I called my opa, kept disappearing on full moons until he was no longer able to walk. Soon after that, he was admitted to the hospital and came down with a bad infection, passing away a short while later from a myriad of complications. Strangely, after his death, my dad took up the tradition of disappearing during full moons. He never did it before Opa passed away, but suddenly he started exhibiting the exact same behavior. I'm heading out, he would say to my mother, putting on his coat and leaving the house right before sunset. I'll see you in the morning. Again? You really are turning into your father. My mom would call after him as he hurried down the porch steps, sometimes jogging or running, as if late for an appointment. She didn't realize how right she was. Eventually I moved away and went to college. Found a girlfriend and got engaged, married, bought a house. If you want to sum up my entire life in one sentence, I guess that about does it. Except something happened recently, derailing that one sentence description of my existence and turning it into a rambling run-on with no end in sight. My father called and told me he needed to talk to me about something. He said it was important and couldn't wait. I needed to come over right away. What is it? I asked once we were finally alone in his basement man cave. He poured two glasses of scotch halfway to the brim, then added a bit more for good measure. He handed me one of the glasses and I took it, eyeing him suspiciously. I don't drink, I reminded him. Trust me, you'll want that. He sat down on a leather chair across from me, the fire roaring beside him. I took a tentative sip and winced at the burn, smacking my lips to try and appreciate the taste, then set the glass down on the table beside me. I've been trying to keep this from you for as long as possible. I have to tell you something important about your Opa. Opa's been dead for years, I smiled nervously. You're not losing your memory, are you, Dad? My memory's fine. Just listen, okay? Your Opa had a secret, and now it's my secret. And I have to pass it on to you. It's important, okay? Just, just trust me. All right, I said nervously and took another sip of the drink. The burn wasn't as bad this time. It was more like a warmth that coated my throat and sizzled in my stomach. You remember how Opa always disappeared on full moons? Did you ever wonder why he did that? And why I started doing it right after he died? It had been a while since I thought about this. I had just accepted it as part of life at a certain point. Like a strange paternal family tradition. I had semi-forgotten about my dad's odd habit of escaping the house on full moons. Looking back at his face, I was surprised by how many new wrinkles had formed around his eyes when I hadn't been paying attention. It occurred to me how often I looked at him without really looking at him. I always thought it was an excuse for you to get out with the guys, go drinking or the strip club or something. Some of my friends tried to convince me you were in a cult, but I told them that was ridiculous. I thought about whether or not I should say my last thought, and it slipped out anyways. A guy at college said you were probably in the mafia. I looked at his somber face, and my chest grew tighter. Then he burst out laughing, breaking the tension. I laughed along with him, still feeling that stone of dread in my belly. I'm not in a cult or the mafia. Okay, well, what is it then? His face turned grave again. He took a sip of his drink. Then he took another. And another. Finally, after several more long moments of silence, he stood up. Let's go for a walk, he said. You need to see it to believe it. I followed after him reluctantly. My father took me out to the woods behind his house, which led deep into a forested wilderness that stretched on for a long, long ways. There was no path, but he seemed to know exactly where he was going, 
as he trudged through the thick grass and brush, leading me deeper and deeper into the woods. What the hell are we doing out here? I asked him, slapping at a mosquito which landed on my neck, leaving a pool of blood on my palm. You'll see, was all he would say. We walked for a long time, mostly without conversation, through the dark forest far away from the path. Finally, we reached my father's intended destination. A little clearing with a few logs situated around a fire pit. It was evening, and sunset was an hour or so away. A full moon was waiting bloated behind the horizon. I glanced over and was alarmed to see a few chains attached to a tree nearby. My eyes traced down the length of them to a set of steel manacles. Dad, what are those chains for? I asked, getting scared. He must have heard the fear in my voice and tried to reassure me. It's okay, son, he said, his eyes locked onto mine. You know I would never hurt you. In a million years, right? I nodded. Good. Now I need you to trust me. Can you do that? Can you trust me? I nodded again, tears welling up in my eyes for reasons I didn't understand. Listen, we have a bit of time. There's no big rush. That's why I brought you out here early. There's a few things I need to tell you. And some are going to be easier to believe than others. But all of them are true. And when I ask you to... Well, when I ask you to do what I need you to do, I need you to not ask any questions. I need you to just do it and trust me, okay? I guess. As long as it's not too crazy. I said, trying to keep it together. Just tell me already, Dad. I'm dying of suspense over here. He motioned for me to sit on one of the logs next to the fire pit. I did so, and he began to build a fire. Despite his age, he could still do it quicker than anyone I'd ever met. I watched him set it alight, and it roared up in an instant inferno. He sat down on a log across the way, and his eyes met mine. My soul felt like it was leaving my body as he spoke his next words. I'm dying, son. It's the big C. I couldn't even respond. All I could do was sit there with my mouth hanging open, staring across the fire at him. The embers popped and sparks flew into the air between us. It's in my colon, which means it's everywhere else, too, according to the doctors. They did the tests, gave me a few options. Chemo and radiation will extend my life, probably, but no guarantees. And there would be side effects. Possibly devastating side effects. I saw how that went with your grandmother, and I'm not going to go through that. Which means I'm going to finish things au natural. I opened my mouth to speak, but he cut me off before I could say a word. It's my choice, so don't argue. They're giving me a few months at most, maybe less. I don't know how I'm going to look in a week or a month, so... I need to tell you all of this now, while I still can. While my mind is still sharp, you understand? I was in shock, unsure of what to say. It wouldn't sink in for several more days, so... At that moment, I just stood up and gave him a big hug, squeezing him tight until he made a pain noise. For the first time, I noticed how thin he'd gotten lately. My arms used to have trouble making it all the way around his waist, but now I felt his ribs and the lack of a belly. Again, I'd been looking at him, but not really seeing him for a while. What else did you need to tell me? I said, after saying all of the other things that you say when someone you love tells you they're dying. It sounded important, whatever it was. Something about Opa? He nodded, looking solemn. Yes, unfortunately that's even harder news. I really don't want to tell you about this. I have no choice, though. You have to understand that I tried. And there is no way out of this. Like the cancer, it's a part of me. It's a part of us. Just remember, no matter what, that I tried. You don't need to go through that, okay? This is a curse, an irreversible one, that has been passed down to my side of the family and my side alone. Only the men are afflicted with it, never the women. We try to keep it from them so they don't have to live with the guilt and the pain that we do. 
I prayed for your mother to have a girl. You have to believe me. I prayed you would not be born into this. What are you talking about, Dad? The cancer? Are you saying that's some sort of family curse? That's crazy. I mean, genetics play a part, I'm sure, but it's not... No. He cut me off. We can die from diseases just like any mortal. The stories are all wrong about that. We are merely men with a terrible curse. I waited for him to explain in plain English and hoped that eventually he would get around to it. The sun was drawing closer and closer to the horizon, and that felt like an important detail for some reason. Like an hourglass running out of sand. He stood up and pointed to his belt. It was old, and I realized it was the same one my grandfather had worn. There was a silver wolf head which comprised the buckle. This belt is special, son. It holds an ancient power. It was passed down to me by my father, your opa, and it was given to him by his father before him, going back for hundreds and hundreds of years. This belt is what gives us our power, but it also carries with it a great curse. I stared at him, wondering what the hell he could possibly be talking about. Just listen, he said, as if reading my mind. In about half an hour, you won't need to believe my words. You'll see it for yourself. It's a full moon tonight, Jason. And that means I'm going to turn into something else. A thing that's not quite a man. Not quite a wolf. Somewhere in between. What? I nearly screamed. That's insane, Dad. This is all nuts. I thought maybe the cancer was affecting his mind. What other reason could there be for such a bizarre, outrageous lie? Instead of debating with me, he just continued on as if I hadn't spoken. This belt is a symbol of our power. But it is more than that. It carries with it our strength and our curse. If you should ever lose it, it will haunt you. Every death you see on the news will be your burden to bear, for you have forsaken your sworn duty. The dead will come to you in your dreams, and you will never truly rest again. Hear my words, son, and remember them. I sat down on the wooden log, landing hard on my ass and nearly toppling it over. Dad, come on, you're kidding me, right? Is this a joke? He shook his head. I wish it was, son, but it's very real. I'm going to prove it to you. No, Dad, you don't have to do that, I yelled, but he ignored me. He stood up and walked over to the tree where chains and manacles were attached. I followed after him, running to catch up. Despite his age, he could still move quickly, and the fire he had started was still roaring behind us, and I had no concerns about tending to it to keep it going. It was blazing high, and he had already stacked a pile of wood nearby to feed it as if planning to stay here for a while. Or maybe, it occurred to me, he was thinking that I would want to stay here for a while with him. I can lock these ones, but I need you to do the last one, my father said, putting the handcuffs around his ankles and wrists. He snapped them shut and locked them with a key. I noticed they hung loosely around his wrists and he could easily escape them. But maybe, just maybe, a voice in my mind said, he would grow into them. Come on, we're running out of time, he said, and I noticed for the first time that the sun had set, and it would soon be fully dark. It was twilight now, and there was very little light remaining. An orange full moon was cresting large on the horizon. Normally I would argue with him, but I could tell he was serious and would be very upset if I tried. Feeling numb, I went over to the steel bracelet on his left wrist and locked it with the key he handed me. Then I stood back, surveying the strange scene, Mosquitoes were buzzing and landing on my neck, and I slapped at them, wishing I'd brought bug spray. They were landing on my dad, too, but he didn't seem to notice them. This is gonna get ugly, he said. Whatever I do, don't try to help me. Don't try to assist me in any way. It's gonna look like I'm in pain, and I am gonna be in some pain. But it will only last for a short while, and then I'll be myself again. I opened my mouth to say something, and then closed it again. What the hell could I say? Dad, you don't have to do this, I tried. Whatever's happening to you, I'm, I'm sure it's not. A noise interrupted my speech, and I realized it was the sound of clothing being torn. 
It was his shirt. The skin underneath was bulging and growing like a tumorous lump, but then it smoothed out and spread, turning into a growing ripple of muscle. It stretched down the length of his left arm, hairs bristling out from his skin along the way, following the path of its growth. His left arm now fits snugly in the handcuff which I had assumed was too large for him. He winced and bared his teeth from a sudden pain, letting out a low noise. I reached forward to put my hand on his shoulder. Get back! He roared, and his voice sounded different now. Lower and thicker like the growl of a dog. I stumbled backwards, terrified and startled, tripped over a branch. Landing hard on my back, my head whipped into a rock and bounced up and down a couple times, before settling in the dirt. Pain bloomed back there and I saw stars explode through the darkness of my vision. It's possible I passed out momentarily or for more than a few minutes. When I opened my eyes, all I could think about was the sharp ache at the back of my skull. I reached back to feel the warmth of blood on my hand and held it up to my face to see how bad it was, but it was too dark to tell. I looked down to see my head had collided with a rock which was embedded in the forest floor. The stars were out in the night sky above, but they were not as visible due to the brightness of the full moon and the canopy of swaying tree branches above. Struggling to rise to my feet, I looked to see a creature which appeared to be a werewolf chained to a tree nearby. It stood on its hind legs, flexing and straining against the chains which bound it to the tree. It snapped its teeth and fixed its eyes on me. The dirt at the base of the tree buckled and crunched as if he might lift the whole thing out from the dirt. But the roots held firm and a second later the creature relaxed slightly, its snout sniffing at the air, smelling my blood on the wind. Dad? I whispered, moving closer to it. Is that really you? Are you still in there? The creature standing on two legs was covered in thick, wiry fur, gray streaked with white just like my dad's beard. And when I looked into his eyes, I could see something familiar there. A glimmer in them. But then the beast was snapping its jaws and aggressively growling at me, pulling on its chains as it tried to break free once again. Too much to look at. Too much to bear after the news I had just been given. All of this was too much. It was making me feel sick, lightheaded, just thinking about how much my life had changed in a few short hours. I slowly backed away and went towards the fire, grateful when the sound of growling began to recede, and eventually went away altogether, drowned out by the crackling of the flames and the wind in the trees. The bonfire was guttering, despite my dad's excellent construction of it. I got the feeling I'd been out for a while, judging by the moon and the stars and the sky above. At least it was still going enough that I could coax it back to life. I fed a few more logs onto it and some smaller kindling beneath that, then began to blow on the embers until the dry wood caught a light. Within a few minutes it was roaring again and I was holding my hands up to the blaze to warm them. They were still shaking, and my teeth were chattering from fear and numb shock. But I was starting to settle down a little bit. My father was a werewolf. It didn't seem real, but there it was. There he was. All I needed to do was look over at him to confirm I wasn't dreaming. This was real. I decided to dig around in my dad's bag to see if he'd brought anything to drink. Sure enough, there were hot dogs and cold soda just waiting for me to find them. Cracking one open, I glanced at my dad, the dog man, out of the corner of my eye. He had settled back against the tree as if resigned to his fate. But I thought I could sense an occasional movement, as if he were still testing his restraints. Something else caught my eye at the bottom of the bag, and I took it out to examine it in the light of the fire. Journal, the cover of the book read. A sticky note was attached to the front, and I pulled it off to read it in the light. Hope this helps. Dad. It was his journal, I realized. And he wanted me to read it. I opened it and began to read from the first page as my father struggled and growled in his chains a little ways away. Still trembling with terror, I held the pages close to the fire and began to read, hoping to learn the secrets of my family's curse. Instead, what I found was a record of my father's life, and a startling picture of what my own grim existence would soon look like. January 10th, 2001. In 
finally happen. For years he warned me, and yet I was still not prepared for this. How could anyone hope to be prepared for this? Those people. So many died by my hands. The newspaper called it an animal attack, and that is not so far from the truth. When I am in that form, I am all instinct and anger, completely unable to form rational thoughts. But that does not excuse my lack of preparation. My father told me to prepare, but I used my grief as an excuse to forget. I will go to hell for the things I have done. There is no doubt in my mind about that. Heaven has no place for a man who can tear apart a woman with his bare teeth. Next time I will be more careful. For the next few weeks I will need to devise a plan. I will need to speak to Uncle Horace. He promised to help me, but I do not know how he will manage to do so if he suffers from the same affliction. Still, at the very least, he may be able to give me some advice. Until next time. G.H. I read a few more pages, then realized the fire needed to be fed, and stood up to grab more wood. As soon as I did, I heard a loud growling noise from behind me where my father was chained to the tree. He pulled against the restraints again, and I thought I saw something crack, a piece of the tree splintering and coming loose. But then he settled back again, and I realized it was nothing of consequence, just a piece of bark that had come loose. Or so I thought. After stoking the fire and letting it burn for a while, warming my hands against the heat of the flames, I settled back into reading. February 9th, 2001. It worked. The chains held fast, and the manacles were large enough to keep my wrists secure without injuring myself. My arms are sore and my shoulders ache, but at least my conscience is clean knowing I did everything in my power to prevent disaster. Damn this belt. I wish I could get rid of it. I wish I could just throw it in the ocean and let the tide take it away. But Uncle Horace warned me not to. If I do, then someone else will find it. And who knows what they might do with this power if left unchecked. The world would be safer without us in it. G.H. It was sad to think that my father had help, but I would have none. If this condition was really passed on to me, I would be the last one in our family afflicted with it. I had no kids, and I wasn't planning on having any. And my great-uncle Horace and all the other men in my family had passed away. I was the last man in the Hamburg line, aside from my father. And that meant the family secret would die with me. Assuming I could keep it a secret. It also meant that once my father passed away, there would be no one around to help me with this curse. No one to guide me like Uncle Horace had guided him. The journal I was holding was all I had, aside from the advice of my father, and he didn't have much time left by the sounds of it. Something made a loud cracking sound in the forest behind me, and I stood up and turned around. I saw the vague outline of a person, just a smudge of shadow against the trees, and then heard the air whistling behind me as something large and heavy came swinging at my head. I don't remember it hitting me, only the pain I felt afterwards. The fire was in front of me when I blinked my eyes open, but the flames were blurry and ill-defined. My head was spinning and my ears were ringing as I tried to focus on the man in front of me who was speaking. He snapped his fingers once, twice, three times, as if trying to get me to pay attention. There we go, wakey-wakey, he said, grinning. Nice job, fellow hunter. Sorry to blindside you like that, but we had to be sure. Rumor has it there's some sick freaks around here. We're friendly with these creatures. Uh, I groaned, trying to form words. What are you... Who are you? I looked around to see more men nearby, all dressed in camouflage. Hunters, he said. Dogman hunters. Shit. I looked over to see where my dad was chained up. There were two men taking pictures of him with their cell phones, while he growled and snapped his teeth at them. Yo, nowhere near as accomplished as you, though, the man's friend said. I've seen a few of them, but never caught one and chained it up. Damn, dude, how'd you manage that? I tried to think up a lie. 
My head was still spinning, though, and I was having trouble thinking straight. Hey, Dave, check this out, one of the guys near my father said, pointing at the belt around his waist. I stood up on shaky legs and wandered over to join the group of them. Yeah, it's weird. He, he was wearing that belt when I found him, I muttered, trying to think of what to say on the fly. How'd you manage to subdue this beast, brother? One of the men asked. He was tall, with a long black beard, wearing plaid and a black jacket. Almost looks like a prior arrangement to me. The group of them turned to look at me suspiciously. A prior arrangement? I asked. What's that even mean? This brought more murmurs from the group, and I heard a few unkind whispers about my true allegiance. Where's your gear, brother? Your rifle and all your equipment? A louder grumbling began to rise up from the men, as a few of them began to move towards me. Is this your journal? A voice asked me from behind, reading through it aloud. All of my family's secrets suddenly being spoken out into the world for this whole group of men to hear. He's one of them, someone said. We can't let him go. He's a lichen. A beast. From hell. Two of them grabbed me from behind while one holding the journal marched over, waving the book in his hand. I asked you a question, he said, smacking me on the forehead with the leather-bound book. Is this yours? I stared at him defiantly, the whole time watching my father out of the corner of my eye. He was still pulling at the restraints, testing them, straining against them with all of his might. The tree was bending against his efforts, the trunk splintering and cracking. It was my father's, I spat, looking behind him fully now with the creature chained to the tree. It belongs to my father. There was a grumbling amongst the group members, and then finally one of them spoke up loudly. We'll kill them both. Even if he's not one of them yet, he's got it in his blood. It's only a matter of time before he goes through the transformation. Grab him. Don't let him get away. I turned to run, but it was too late. They were already on me. One of the men tackled me, pinning me to the ground while another approached with a pistol. He cocked it, then aimed it at my head. Silver bullets might. Might in myself. The cold steel of the barrel was pressed up against my forehead, digging into my skin. Any last words, Lycan? I tried to speak, but all that came out was a whimper. I wasn't ready to die. There was so much more I wanted to do in life. All of my dreams and plans for the future... All of my brightest memories and the faces of my loved ones flashed before my eyes. And I waited for the bullet that would end my life. Guess not. I felt the man tense up as he was about to pull the trigger. And then something broke. A loud crack erupted from nearby. Chains rattled and shook. Steel snapped and then there was screaming from all around. I opened my eyes to look around and saw a bloodbath. The men who had been surrounding me were being slaughtered by a gray streak that moved faster than anything I'd seen before. It was a blur of movement, stopping for a second to disembowel a hunter, and then swiftly moving on to the next. Blood erupted into the air to my left and then my right. A fountain, a geyser, as men's throats were ripped out and their arms detached, and they tried to fight back ineffectually. It was like watching ants try to fight against a man. They stood no chance. The man who had been ready to shoot me was the last one left alive. He held his gun with both hands, trying to keep it steady in his trembling hands. Each time the creature paused, he tensed up and got ready to fire. But an instant later, it was moving again. A blur streaking through the air, reappearing somewhere else before he could get a shot off. I realized the creature was toying with him, as the beast grinned, showing its many long, sharp teeth. When he finally did manage to shoot at the beast, each bullet missed wild. He backed away, stumbling and falling over a tree trunk. The man crab-walked backwards, trying to find the gun he had dropped among the fallen leaves. The giant wolf creature came toward him, growling low and deep. Stay back! The man shouted, finding his gun. I'll shoot you! I'll... Get back! Get the fuck back! He pulled the trigger again. It fired once, then made several dry clicking noises as he continued to squeeze the trigger, the revolver empty. The creature lunged at him. The man's screams were loud and awful, and I turned my head away so I wouldn't be forced to watch. Eventually, he was quiet and could no longer make a noise. 
For a few minutes, all I could hear was the wet sounds of blood being spilled and teeth working to chew through muscle and bone. When I opened my eyes and looked up, there was the face of a large wolf in front of me, staring right at me. I couldn't help but notice those teeth, long and white, coming to points that could crush a skull with ease. For a moment, I thought I would die, that this form of my father would not recognize me. Its giant bloody maw came down towards me and I cringed backwards, the smell of coppery entrails wafting out from its gullet. But instead of teeth snapping shut on my face, a soft, oversized tongue licked my cheek, and then the warmth of an enormous dog settled down on the forest floor beside me. His breathing was too heavy, too fast, I realized, as I felt the warmth of blood soaking through my shirt. The hunter's last bullet had gotten him. I saw the wound as I sat up to look beside me. His eyes were wide and locked with mine, his mouth open and panting. No. I stroked the soft fur of his cheeks and pressed my face against his. I kissed his forehead and watched as he closed his eyes. His breathing slowed, then stopped. After a long while, I stood up to find a bloodbath all around me. Dead hunters whose families and friends would soon be looking for them. I threw their phones into the blazing fire, hoping the pictures they had taken of my father would not be uploaded to the cloud. I looked down to see the journal had been burnt to embers in the fire. The hunter had dropped it into the blaze before he was torn to shreds. One last insult. One last attack. With the journal gone, I had nothing left to show me the way. I walked back home to get a shovel and began to dig. It took a long, long time to make a pit big enough to bury all those bodies. When I was done, I felt exhausted, but I knew there was still more to do. I took my dad's belt and fixed it around my waist, sending it through the loops of my pants and then looking down at the silver wolf head on the buckle. As I reached down to pick up my father's lifeless corpse, now human again, I found I had more strength than ever before. His body weighed almost nothing. I knew how to get home. And I carried my father back to see the crying eyes of my mother waiting at the door. As if she had known all along. It's been almost a month since all this happened. My dad's funeral was a couple weeks back, and... It surprised me again how little of my family is left still alive. No men were there to see him off. Only the women of the family remain. They complimented me on how well I was handling everything. How mature I'd become. They said how good I look wearing my father's old belt. That ancient family heirloom that nobody wants. As if it's cursed. I have no one to help me now. No one to guide me. But I've been preparing for the next full moon. I found a sturdy tree, bigger than the last, deeper in the wilderness of the forest. And I've fixed it with manacles and thick steel chains. I'm watching the calendar. Ready for the next full moon. I'm terrified, but... After reading my father's journal, I refused to make the same mistake he did. I may be a monster now, but I will not allow myself to turn into a cold-blooded killer. Unless I chance upon another dogman hunter, wandering alone in the forest. My knees ached as I lowered myself down the worn stone steps. While not an unmanageable task, even at the seasoned age of 107, I dread the descent every morning. Not quite as much as I dread the inevitable return up the stairs at the end of the evening, though. Musings of having an elevator installed cross my mind daily, but I know that the risk of exposing my work isn't worth it. No sense in hiding these deadly oddities, just to have a day laborer unwittingly release a demon back into the world. When I finally reached the landing at the bottom of the stairs, 
I propped myself up against a wooden table and drew in ragged breaths. Limited immortality had sounded so much better than this when I had taken the position so very long ago. No one had bothered to tell me that my body would age and decline just the same. My tissue paper thin lungs had filled with air again, and my pulse was beginning to normalize as I turned my body around to face the squat wooden table on the landing. Directly in the center of the table sat a fist-sized oval, made of solid gold and inlaid with delicate bone filigree. I had always assumed the ornamentation was made from human bone, but I would never know for sure. My predecessor hadn't known either. But such dark objects lead to reasonable assumptions. Shakily, I slid my right index finger into a hole in the golden oval, until I felt a prick of pain as something sharp slipped into my leathery skin. The urge to withdraw my finger from the relic each day was still a struggle to suppress. Pulsing pain radiated into my wrist like arthritis, and I could feel the blood being drawn from my finger. When it stopped, I removed the digit and rubbed the end of it on my thumb. I grow tired of the taste of your blood, immortality, hissed a multi-layered voice from the oval. You will bring me something younger soon. Felix. High demands from a demon trapped in an egg, Zethra, I replied mockingly. I have a bit more work to do before you keep someone else alive for a cursed century. You live so long. I accept your offering of blood, Zethra said angrily. You will not be immortality forever. Quiet, egg dweller, I responded as I shuffled down the hallway towards the archives. With an attitude like that, I'm likely to give you a dip in the barrel. Silence. Even the likes of Zethra feared being placed in the barrel. Shuffling footsteps bounced off the rough granite walls of the hallway as I made my way toward the archive. The heavy door glowed lightly with runes that I had never before been able to read. It didn't matter anyhow. My predecessor had shown me the order in which to touch them to open the door so their meaning had little significance to me. My throbbing index finger traced a path between the correct runes, and I heard the latch click and the hinges gave a low groan, and the door opened inward. For the last 85 years, I have been the senior archivist for the historical society of a tiny midwestern town. We display antique tools, turn-of-the-century documents, and rusted pieces of Americana, for bored schoolchildren to look at and forget during obligatory school field trips. Our genealogy office sees a bit more of an enthusiastic response from the older citizens here. My real work, however, is found 50 feet down the stone steps, below the historical society and beyond the ruined oak door. There I am, the archivist. Fancy title, I know. The archive has been there long before this town ever existed. For all the wonders and terrors held within, my organization knows precious little of the origin of this place. For that matter, we often know little of the objects we collect, other than the power that they possess, and the possible implications to the world at large. The objects themselves come in at random intervals. A bedraggled man or woman appears at the Historical Society desk a few times a year and presents me with a brown, paper-wrapped box. They tell me it is a donation for the Historical Society. Then they place a copper coin with a crucifix and half-moon stamped on it down on my desk. We nod at one another and they depart. These are the Venators. Relic Hunters. At this point, my work actually begins. I would leave my apprentice Thomas to watch the society as I trudge down those damnable steps with the new package. Zethra gets its daily drink and I receive another day of life in return. This ritual I must perform daily, package or not. I will continue feeding that imp until Thomas is prepared to assume my duties as the archivist. Relics are sorted into two categories upon arrival. Archive and Termination. Archive relics aren't necessarily banal objects, but they are safe enough to store without causing havoc by their sheer presence. 
An excellent example of this is found on aisle 3, shelf 4. Carved from Brazilian rosewood and adorned with silver bands, the pen of a maimon is easily contained. Without a hand to wield it, the thing holds no power. In the hand of the unsuspecting, death is certain. If gripped in a bare hand, the pen will begin to draw blood from the user as ink. Enthralled by the pen, the wielder will be compelled to write every sin and wrongdoing they have committed over their lifetime. No poor deed is too small to be drawn forth on a crimson-laced page. Worst yet, there is no man or woman alive who would run out of evil deeds before they run out of the precious ink. The pen sits in a resin case as it has for many decades. No touch. No trouble. Termination relics are those that simply cannot be contained. Their existence is such that proximity alone can lead to calamity. An unfortunate example of this can be found on aisle 1, shelf 2. Roughly twice the size of a marble, the glass ball is filled with swirls of crimson and obsidian. Trayman's eye. What a terrible thing. While unassuming in appearance, too much time in its proximity proves maddening. Spending more than two to three weeks within a hundred foot radius of Trayman's eye will drive anyone to madness, and eventually homicidal actions. Though the victim of the eye believes the thoughts to be their own, it is actually the malevolent whispers of the glass sphere. The voice of Trayman will fill your mind with irrational feelings and beliefs about your friends and loved ones until you are driven to take their lives. With all of my years of experience handling cursed objects, Trayman's eye toys even with me. My thoughts in the last few weeks have begun to dwell on believing my assistant Thomas has some dark purpose for the archive. If you're wondering why I've been so careless as to leave it here long enough for these thoughts to invade my mind, I assure you it was not done lightly. I've investigated methods to contain the dark whispers from the sphere to avoid its now obviously necessary destruction. Sadly, my efforts have been in vain. Trayman's eye will have to enter the barrel. The barrel is the last known Sangua de Cristo, Sanguis Christi for my Latin-speaking friends, or for the English inclined it is simply the blood of Christ, stored in a cask made of Jerusalem pine and banded in braided gold. It is the last of its kind. This is also why we must determine whether or not to destroy an artifact. You see the barrel is finite, and the process of submerging and destroying these objects consumes the last bits of its precious liquid. So I began my work. Fortunately for me, my walk was short to the doomed artifact. When I reached the shelf and looked at the swirling glass sphere, I could already hear the voice that sounded much like my own mind whispering, The boy will destroy everything you've worked so hard for, Immortality. Nonsense, demon. I am aware that you know what I am, Felix. Yet still, I tell you, the boy will be your doom. This can be stopped, if you spare me. Anything facing its own destruction would tell the same lies, Trayman. Ask the djinn if you do not believe me. Thomas releases him when you are away. Beware, Felix. I'll take this under consideration, Tremon. Farewell. With this back and forth finished, I pulled the silver tongs from my pocket and used them to grasp the orb on the shelf. I shuffled my feet toward the workbench and placed the sphere on a purple velvet pillow and settled myself on the stool. My knuckles throbbed as I lifted the heavy wooden lid from the barrel nestled in the center of my workbench. A rich aroma of cardamom, myrrh, and copper filled the air as I gently placed the lid to the side. Taking the tongs, I lifted the sphere from the velvet pad and dropped it into the barrel. I heard the plunk of the sphere as it fell through the thick liquid and settled to the bottom of the cask. Low shrieks and the sound of bubbling filled the room but I didn't bother to look inside the barrel. I had seen the process enough times that the novelty had worn away. I recovered the barrel and prepared to leave the archive for the day. 
Trayman was no more, and I had grown tired. My eyes drifted towards the brass gin lamp on aisle one, shelf four, as the demon's words filled my head. Ask the gin if you do not believe me. Perhaps I would tomorrow. Trayman's influence had left me, but still, I worried. Thomas would need to be prepared to take over my position soon. Zethra was right. I wouldn't be immortality forever. When I arrived at the Historical Society building today, the lights were still off, and I became concerned. It was Tuesday, and Thomas was generally here in the early hours of the morning, warming the building and readying it for tours. I saw no sign of his car as I slowly made my way up the path towards the door. When I reached the front, the door unlocked, and I warily stepped inside. Thomas? I yelled into the darkness. Anyone? Hello? No answer returned to me. I turned and locked the door behind me and patted my jacket pocket to be sure I had something to defend myself with. My weapon was always there, but it comforted me to feel it below my hand. The main floor of the society building was empty. My knees already ached and my chest rose and fell rapidly, just from the energy expended in my initial search. Dread filled me for the walk down the stairs to the archive. The descent took me much longer than usual. Bracing myself against the squat wooden table, I closed my eyes tightly and struggled to smooth out my breathing, from pants to long, even breaths. When I opened my eyes, the first thing I noticed was the absence of Zethra's egg. The table was empty. A table that had been in place for over two hundred years now sat empty. My wavering heart thumped its own weak impression of panic as the finality of the situation dawned on me. Zethra was gone. For the first time in eighty-five years, the timer to my demise began to tick away in my mind. Pushing myself away from the table, I made my way down the hall, only to see the heavy oak door shredded to splinters and littering the floor. As I crossed through the destroyed barrier, two things immediately stole my attention. Every aisle of the archive was now barren. Not a single shelf held an item. Worse yet, I could see the Jerusalem pine barrel turned on its side. All of the crimson liquid spread across the floor, dried and flaking. The only item left of the centuries of collection sat on the edge of my workbench. The gin's lamp. Unable to act of its own agency, it had been stored as an archive relic. Now it alone remained. Warm tears traced down the deep lines of my face as I forced myself in motion toward the lamp. I rubbed the butt of my palm against the smooth sides and looked at the gray mist that poured out from the spout. A translucent and emaciated figure appeared before me and sneered. It wore only a loincloth and golden jewelry. Every bone and joint protruded cartoonishly beneath the tight skin of its body. The pupilless eyes flickered a dull white glow as the thing gazed in my direction. Immortality, the djinn said. Why have you summoned me? Where are the relics, Devine? I asked, anger boiling in my voice. Who has done this? Devine, the djinn, smiled at me, revealing a mouth full of gold-capped and jagged incisors. Thomas he replied simply. I shook my head. No, I replied. Thomas wouldn't have done this. He knows the dangers that lurk here. Oh, he has freed us all, Devine replied without emotion. He has taken these wonders and will free them back into the world to do their work. You are at an end, Felix. Thomas has seen to this. Taking Zethra hasn't killed me, I said in return. It has simply put me on a timer. Return to your lamp, Devine. No, it replied with a smile. Devine raised a withered arm in my direction and I began lifting off the ground. At first, the pressure removed from my aching knees was almost welcome until the pain began. 
It felt as though a monstrous snake had wrapped around my body to squeeze the life out of me. He freed me too, you fool, spat the djinn. You have no power here anymore. The price for my freedom was to remain here and end the great immortality. I could feel the air being pressed from my lungs. Small sensations like the cracking of dry twigs spread first across my ribcage and then across my entire body. Consciousness was slipping away and my vision was beginning to cloud. Then, I realized that the djinn's lamp was still hooked on my left index finger. With the last of my strength, I drew the lamp to my chest and shoved my right hand into the pocket of my jacket. Gripping the vial within, I pulled it out and held the vial to my mouth. Biting the cork with my teeth, I pulled it from the vial, and drops of blood from inside splashed out onto my face. Not too much of it, I hope. I poured the final precious vial of Sangua de Cristo out of the crystal tube onto the lamp wrapped around my finger. The metal began to sizzle and melt away into a puddle on the floor below me. Air rushed back into my lungs as the snake-like grip around my body loosened and vanished before dropping me to the ground. As I laid on the ground in a helpless pile, I looked towards Devine. His expression was vacant and his eyes locked in on the area where he had held me in the air moments ago. Slowly, his body began to wobble in a circle and his jaw fell slack. A cascade of yellow and purple light burst out of his mouth and dissipated into the room. And with that, Devine dissolved into nothingness. I'm not sure what I will do from here, but I'll figure something out. It's not as though I really have any damn choice in the matter. My bastard apprentice has stolen thousands of cursed objects. If that wayward djinn is to be believed, then these items will be sent back out into the world that I have tried so desperately to keep safe. So beware, strange items. If you receive something valuable that you weren't expecting from a stranger, do not accept it. I don't know where or how these relics will find their way out, but I'm afraid that this mad scheme will be seen through to the end. Should you happen upon one of these demonic vessels, I simply ask you to do the following. Take them to your local historical society. Tell them that it is a donation, but you lack the coin. Hell, tell them Felix sent you. They'll know what to do. As for me, I am immortality no more. Zethra got its wish. This warning may be my final act in attempting to help this world. If any Venators are reading this, then I beg you to complete your work. It has never been more important. We are losing this battle. But it is the world that will pay the price. Everybody has that story they tell. The memory hangs out in the backseat of your mind, waiting for the right moment to chip in the group and share your childhood fear. The first time you were scared, the first time you felt real fear. By the time you tell the story, you almost forgot it ever happened. Maybe it was just a fever dream you had as a child. Maybe the circumstances were fabricated by your adolescent imagination. Even though you doubt it even happened, the memory still lingers. Held dearer than what should have been your cherished memories when you were younger. When you think back, you don't remember the first time you tied your shoes or the first basketball hoop you made. You think of that story. It's there, waiting. Almost as if it has unfinished business with you. Like you're not allowed to move on from it yet. And you tell the story, with a big smile on your face. The ones around you laughing so hard they ugly cry. Because your experience was so real and relatable. It could have happened to them just as easily as it happened to you. And once you've shared it, you feel better. And the memory retreats back to its den hibernating until the stars align and it can torment you once more. I was at work when the opportunity presented itself. The night shift was over and we were all in the locker room, exchanging the thick uniforms and heavy boots for Crocs and basketball shorts. Terry was telling a story about his fear of rats, his face a half grin as he struggled to get through it without laughing. I was on the bench unlacing my boots. 
Dude, I'd been looking for this fucking rat for weeks. I would always see it out of the corner of my eye, the little bastard scurrying around when I was trying to sleep. Turns out it made a nest in the box spring. I'd been sleeping on it, dude, Terry says, shivering as he thought back. The other guys laughed, a cackling chorus of grown men amused by someone else's demise. I laughed as well. Terry was well known for his fear of rodents, and was heckled about it constantly. They went back and forth over the details as I kicked off my boots. How did he deal with it? Did he burn the mattress? Did he let it sleep there forever? As the laughter dies down, I think of my own story, and wonder if I should tell it. At first I shiver at the thought, but before I know it, I'm grinning myself and dying to let it out. The old memory resurfaces like a shark from the deep. A story that happened 23 years ago. A story about a beaver. Alright, I got one. Terry, you'll especially like this, I say standing up. The guys listen, still wiping the tears from the rat in Terry's mattress. It's been so long since I thought of the beaver, and the details flood in as I picture it in my head. Alright, so this was a really long time ago, like when I was a kid, I think I was five or six. Anyway, I used to live in this trailer park over on Rainbow Road. That one over there by the highway. I vaguely point north as I close my locker. There's a few interjections before the story continues. Wait, Rainbow Road? Oh, yeah, I know that place. My aunt used to live there. Yo, you used to live in the Cans, Jerry? Over by 94? Yeah, a long time ago. Been ages, I say, and resume the story. Anyway, it was in the summer back in the 90s, and we were all playing outside. Not shit to do. There was nothing but trailers and a long line of mailboxes. We were all poor, and there was no playground to play at, so most of the time the kids just group up, and we would walk around and play with rocks and shit. We would walk around all day, and our parents didn't care, as long as we didn't go by the highway. They were always worried about a car hitting us, I say, and in my mind I can hear the sounds of cars passing by. So there's like five of us playing by this trailer that didn't have anyone living in it. And all of a sudden one of the kids just freezes and says, uh, what is that? And we all look, and sitting on the porch of the trailer is this big fucking beaver just staring at us. I say, the beaver's black eyes and teeth clear in my mind. I shudder at the thought of it. The guys laugh, and Terry visibly cringes. So we're all frozen there, all of us too scared to move. We've never seen one before. We're all terrified of this beaver, and it's just staring us down. We're just waiting for it to rush us, like it was going to eat our bones or something. Real scary shit. Anyway, there's this girl standing next to me. I think, I think her name was uh, Kirsten. And she whispers to me and says, Go get your mom, we'll stay here. My house was the closest, only two trailers down. So I run home thinking this beaver's going to chase me, like it's some kind of horror movie or something. And I run and tell my mom, and she starts yelling about us playing by the highway, and the whole time I'm just scared shitless this beaver was going to eat my friends by the time we got back. No shit. What happened? Did it attack you guys? One of the guys say, and I laugh. No. My mom grabbed a broom, and we went back, and she pretty much shooed it off. But I still can't shake the look that beaver gave us. We really thought it was going to eat us. I fucking hate beavers, dude. I finish the story, and they all laugh. All except for Terry, who looks like he found something new to add to his list of rodent fears. I chuckle to myself at the thought of the memory, feeling a bit of the weight lift from my mind, like a shred of the trauma has healed. After some brief shit-talking, we all punch out and leave the building, everyone walking to their cars with their heads held high, now that the day's work is done. I wave goodbye and get in my car. As I watch the other guys pull away and drive off, I find myself sitting there in silence, pondering the story I told. I think of the beaver story, with its nasty buck teeth and black eyes. I think of how funny it is looking back, and I hear the laughter of the guys in my head. The longer I think about it, though, the more the laughter fades away, and the more I hear screams instead. I think of the story, suddenly feeling guilty, wondering why I said it in the first place. Maybe after all this time, I'm just trying to make myself feel better. In my head, the memory unravels. I think of the story, and how it's a lie. There is no beaver, there never was. 
I'd lean my head on the steering wheel. I hadn't thought of it in so long. I was sure I could leave it in the past. I hear the screams. My own screams and those of the other children. I think of the unexplainable memory. Pushed so far in the back of my mind. Kirsten was my first crush. I remember her freckled face and short hair and a little red ball cap she would always wear. Everyone thought she looked like a boy, but I thought she was pretty, even though I really didn't know the meaning of the word. She lived across the park in a yellow trailer and would always come over to play when all the kids got together. There were five of us, and only a few of us had bikes. So if we all wanted to play together, we would usually walk around and play with sticks and stuff like that. Sometimes we'd play tag or red rover. But that day we just found ourselves walking around bored. The trailer park was an oval formation. The mobile home was placed in a loop with a circular road in the middle. It was surrounded by trees. Except for the side that I lived on, which was tucked into a hill that the highway was built on. It was nice outside that day. And our parents had booted us all out of the house so we could enjoy the weather. So they would have some peace and quiet. They only had two rules. Don't talk to strangers. And don't go near the highway. The park wasn't fenced off or anything, and you could hear cars and trucks flying past all day long. We were walking the road in a little group, doing laps without any real plan. We continued like this for a while, every time passing each other's houses and telling jokes, sometimes nagging our parents if we could come in yet. Two trailers down from mine was the only vacant lot in the park. Nobody lived there as far as we knew. The driveway was always empty, with a concrete slab in place of a trailer. The backyard consisted of an uphill climb through the trees that led straight to the highway. It was silly, but between the emptiness of the vacant trailer and the sounds of the highway, it felt like that specific lot was separate from the rest of the park. I don't know if it was the shade from the overgrown trees, the layers of old pine needles on the ground, or the dead sticks scattered around the unkempt yard. There was always something about it, like it was in its own little bubble. That's when the dare started. On that particular boring day, one of the kids had the idea that for every lap we took around the park, one of us would have to step foot on the lot. The mini barren zone always gave us the willies, and the thought of pushing the boundaries of the scary property gave us all a shot of rebellious adrenaline. At first I thought it was scary, and I was worried about getting in trouble. But when I saw Kirsten perk up giddily, I decided to play along so I could impress her. Whatever I could do to seem cool and make her smile. It felt like we were doing something bad, and the excitement of who would go the furthest would hurry us along as we walked each lap around the park. We would take turns. Each lap, one of us would walk into the driveway. The next would go up and touch one of the sticks, etc. I remember on one of my turns, I crept into the yard behind the little driveway and sprinted back comically yelling like something was chasing me all the way back to the road. Looking back, it was immature, but it felt like the unexplainable gloom was always trying to nip at your heels. Hours passed as we repeated the cycle. A lap around the park, then one of us running in. There, toward the end, we were jogging around the park, all of us excited to take our next turn. As time went on, kids would get called to come back home, and the group began to dwindle. We started to push faster, each of us paranoid to be the next kid to be walking away from the fun with our heads hung low as the others laughed. Before we knew it, almost everyone had gone home. Everyone except Kirsten and I. I remember it being my turn next and the both of us running back to do one more stunt. The sun was already starting to set, and we knew any minute our parents would call us. I remember running alongside her sweating and gasping for breath as the laps tired our legs. Kirsten huffed and laughed as she ran, holding the bill of her cap so it wouldn't fly off. This one would be the craziest, I thought. It was my chance to really impress her. I would go into the woods this time, maybe even close to the highway. When we came to the driveway, however, we both stopped. Our smiles faded and the sun seemed to fizzle away in an instant. There was an old run-down trailer on the vacant lot, like it had appeared out of thin air. The dingy green paint was peeling, and the porch looked like it was going to collapse. 
The drapes in the windows were nicotine-stained and ratty, barely concealing the complete darkness within. As I watched, the front door creaked open slightly. From the darkness within, a groaning whisper escaped. No lights on inside. No car in the driveway. What the... I looked at Kirsten for validation, but she wasn't even looking at the trailer. She was looking at the woman in the yard. It was then I noticed her, off towards the trees. She was standing with her back turned, and even though we couldn't see her face, we knew something was horribly wrong. Once white clothes were heavily stained and ripped up, fitting awkwardly on her frame. One of her legs was bent backwards, and one of her arms was missing, a heavy drizzle of blood oozing from the stump. Despite how mangled she was, she stood perfectly still. We just stood there for a time, both of us silently gawking at her. The air was chilly, like a temperature drop before a bad storm. Kirsten looked at me, the color drained from her face. Without a word, both of us looked in the direction of our homes, to see which one was closest to run to. When we looked back in the direction of the woman, we noticed she had silently moved closer. Her back was still turned, but we could see the damage clearer. Horribly road-rashed muscle. Black streaks on her clothing from the combination of tires and asphalt. What do we do? Kirsten whispered, her voice a whimper. I, I don't know. I managed, my bladder suddenly feeling like it was going to burst. I remember my legs shaking. Maybe we could... Ahead of us, the woman turned. Not in a normal sense, but like she blinked facing a different direction. Like someone had flipped a paper over while our eyes were closed. The sight of her face provoked a gasp from both of us. I was crying now, filled with the confused fear you have when you wake up from a terrible nightmare. The woman was missing her bottom jaw, and with it, half of her upper face. The only identifiable thing left of her top jaw was a hanging, bloody tongue, and her two front teeth. A single eye looked at me angrily, the pupil surrounded by the dark splotching of burst blood vessels. No sound emitted from the woman, but seeing the way she stood there frozen in place, I couldn't explain it. Something was wrong. Horribly wrong. Your house is closer. Run. Get your mom. Kirsten whispered, her voice trembling. Her breath came out as fog. The mangled woman remained in place, but her single eye was looking at Kirsten now. Before our eyes, she blinked forward, three feet closer in Kirsten's direction. I wanted to reach for her hand, but it seemed so far away. I looked at her freckled face, tears streaming down them as she stood as still as possible. But, I whimpered, and the mangled woman blinked again, a few more feet facing our direction. Without a single sound, the eye glared angrily at me. I sobbed as she grew closer once more. Her eye dilated in response to my noise, and at her side her only remaining hand twitched. Just go! Kirsten's shout echoed across the park, rustling birds from the trees. I turned and ran, my shoes skipping down the sidewalk. I couldn't breathe. I looked over my shoulder, the terrified look on Kirsten's face and the woman shifting closer burning into my memory. Even as she drew closer to her, Kirsten kept her eyes on me, weeping silently as she watched me go, as she made sure I could get away. My house was only a few trailers away, but I felt like I was running across town. My legs were weak, my thoughts raced. The further I got from that yard, the warmer it seemed to get. The sun began to feel hot, but my blood was still cold. I tried to focus on the patio door to my home where my mom would be inside where I could get her to save us. The adrenaline crawled across me like ice, and I thought just for a moment that everything was going to be okay. It was all just a nightmare. My mom would show up and fix things just like she did all the other times I had a problem. By the time I made it to my yard, Kirsten screamed. The shrill cry of terror and pain made me stumble, and I fell to the ground. I looked behind me frantically, but Kirsten and the woman were gone. All I could see was an empty yard, and I started shaking. I looked to my front door, then back to where I left Kirsten. I didn't know what to do. 
I thought it would take too much time to get my mom. I shook and sobbed on the ground as my adolescent brain tried to compute the right thing to do. I just wanted to help. I just wanted her to be okay. Behind me, Kirsten screamed again. She was getting further away. I got back on my feet and ran back to the phantom trailer, cursing myself for leaving her alone. We should have just ran together. Why didn't we just run together? No, 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 no. I sobbed, my stomach desperately wanting to purge its contents. My legs begged me to stop, but I pushed them forward. My sneakers scuffed the sidewalk. I ran past the neighbor's yard and rounded the corner of the trailer that shouldn't exist. When I got to the yard, I couldn't see either of them. The same awful chill returned, and a mist was working its way across the yard. My eyes followed the source, a ghostly fog that was cascading down the front porch. It was spilling from the trailer, the tiny crack of the door, and the darkness inside. The doorway groaned as the fog billowed out, widening slightly with a creak. The windows started to bleed and the shutters shriveled like burning plastic. But the worst thing of all was what I saw in the trees. The woman was dragging Kirsten by her arm, painfully whipping her around every time she blinked up the hill dragging her towards the highway. I screamed for her to stop. The mangled woman paused only for a moment, her destroyed mouth reverberating with what I could only describe as a snarl. Kirsten howled in pain as she clawed at the woman, the bruising grip worsening as her helpless hands passed through a seemingly ethereal body. Unnatural and horrible, the mangled woman ascended the hill, every freeze-frame blink bringing them closer to the roaring traffic. I ran after them. I made it halfway across the yard before my foot caught on something, sending me face first into the foggy ground. My palms slapped the ground, softening the fall on something rough and sharp. I tried to get up, but something grabbed at my ankle, winding tight like rope as I tried to shake it free. Kirsten's screaming got weaker the further she got away from me. The fog dispersed as I thrashed to get free, and through it saw no grass at all. The canvas of pine needles and leaves was replaced by hundreds, thousands of dead birds. I looked behind me and shouted for help, hoping to see my mom or one of the neighbors rushing to help. I saw nothing but an empty street and twisting vines wrapping around my ankles. When I turned back to the hill, Kirsten was holding onto a tree, trying to resist the mangled woman's grip. Her fingers clung to the bark and her sneakers formed jagged ruts in the earth. This slowed the woman for a moment, but she retaliated by breaking Kirsten's wrist. The wet snap followed by the worst sound I have ever heard. I want to say I broke free. Sometimes when I dream, I break free from the vines and I make it through the fog. Other times, grown-ups show up and everything is okay. Sometimes Kirsten has the strength to free herself and we get away together. And sometimes there is no mangled woman at all, it's only the beaver. In reality, the true ending can never be denied. The version where my scream can only join hers. Scream as I reach helplessly, and the mangled woman makes it to the road. I watch as the truck takes them. An impact so forceful and sudden they simply blink away, leaving nothing but streaks on the highway and a hat on the wind that matched the color. The fog recedes into the trailer like a movie being rewound. The blood seeps back into the grass and the curtains unshrivel. The warmth returns and the parents flock outside, mortified and speechless as they press me for answers. In time, my screaming fades, replaced by the howling of sirens in the distance. I look up from my steering wheel and dry my tears. The parking lot is empty and everyone else has left work except for me. I think of the images in my head, the weeping eyes I can't unsee, cries I can't seem to forget. When I start my car and shift out of park, I think about the years that have passed by. I think of how I never really spoke to my friends again after that day, and how everyone seemed to chalk it up to two kids who were never supposed to play by the highway. The park seemed to fall apart after that. 
Kirsten's parents moving first with my family to follow. I heard some sort of mass exodus followed a tiny little poor park, reduced to nothing but a memory, to the nearby bars or traveling truckers. Another traffic accident. Another poor lost child. Tonight, instead of taking my usual route, I took a detour. I take the expressway until I see a sign. One so ignored and unkempt you wouldn't know it was there if it wasn't for the reflecting green sign. A sign faded and almost illegible with age. A sign that reads, Rainbow Road. I turn onto the winding path, one that feels more like the entrance to a cemetery than a back road. My car rolls over broken pavement and traverses potholes until I see something in the distance. The only landmark in the otherwise empty space has been consumed by weeds and overgrowth. As I approach the line of old rusted mailboxes, I slow down. Ahead is the concrete circle, but there are no homes, only a loop that's been slowly swallowed up by the forest surrounding it. My headlights cut through the unnatural dark, the special kind that engulfs in the middle of nowhere. I think of a hot summer day and a bunch of bored kids with nothing to do. Letting my car idly crawl, I pull into the loop and survey my surroundings. On Rainbow Road, there are no mobile units to be seen. Each passing slab of the empty lot looks like a gravestone. A gritty reminder of young little lives that will be changed forever. I pass by Kirsten's old lot and think of her freckled face. The way she laughed, and the way she would roll her eyes when I made stupid jokes. I pass by the old lots of my friends' houses and wonder where they're at in the world. I pass by the lot where my home used to be, and think of my mother. A time before the therapy I went through. A time before she started talking less and less. Driving past the old vacant lot, I see no mangled woman and no green trailer. Only the lights of cars flying down the highway on the hill beyond. I look at this one longer expecting to see something more, something of meaning. I look over the weathered surface of its foundation, years of rain slowly chipping away at the concrete, the grass that has overtaken the driveway, the thin layer of gravel reclaimed by the earth. I stare into the trees. I look at every wicked branch in the night. I search for those twisted limbs and malformed face and wonder if it's hiding in there somewhere. I listen for the screams and find cicadas instead. Nothing but empty lots, overgrown grass and fleeing rodents. When I reach the end of the circle, I see the exit and stop. I see the winding road and how it's been so long since I've been here. How I'll have no reason to come back. I let off the brake and keep turning left, going over the same vacant spaces again but this time I think of the good times. I think of every dare that didn't end in tragedy. I think of every boring summer day where we climbed trees or played tag. I think of every smile Kirsten made and how it would give me butterflies in my stomach. When I reach the end of the circle, I decide to go again, my head filled with laughter and smiles, the kind no longer thought by a late 20s man. When that one's through, it leads to another and another, each passing tree and remembered backyard spawning memories long buried under the suffering of loss long ago. Memories deserving remembrance. I kept on the loop for a while, holding the same angle on the wheel as I drove in a circle into the late hours of the night. I thought of many memories, reliving them like they were yesterday, until something changed. The flashing strobe was blinding and unexpected, and part of me wondered how I didn't even see it coming in the first place. The squad car must have followed me with its lights off for a while, and I was none the wiser. I pulled my car over right in front of where my old house used to be. Putting it in park, I sighed as he ran my plates. The cop took their time, both of our engines running idly in the middle of nowhere. 
When they finally emerged from their car, I had my license and registration ready. I rolled down the window in time to see an old officer. Headlights illuminating a mustached face, white with age. When I offered my paperwork, he waved it off with a question. What are you doing out here this time of night, kid? Getting high? Getting drunk? He asked impatiently as he looked inside my car. No, just visiting a friend, I guess, I said, and he blinked at me. Very funny. You know how many times I get called out here? Look, you kids come out here screwing around, shooting up, causing trouble where there's no reason for it. I thought maybe after they set fire to the last trailer out here and we leveled it with the dozer, that'd be the end of it. But now you're here, driving circles until dispatch picks it up. There ain't nothing out here, kid. Either you're lying or you got the wrong address, he said sternly, his frown curving his mustache. She passed away a long time ago. She was hit by a truck on the highway, I said, and there was an immediate sadness in his eyes. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, he said and collected himself. That was a long time ago, but I remember it clearly. I was the first on the scene. Terrible, terrible thing. Family brought flowers out here for years. And after everyone moved away, they were the last people who came by. They weren't trying to cause trouble. But after a while, they stopped coming. Now this place is just an overgrown hole, he said, solemnly trailing off. I thought of the family visiting each year, and the thought of long, wilted flowers deeply saddened me. I looked around the park as the officer collected himself, looking over the empty lots until my eyes rested on that particular one two doors away from mine. I felt the icy chill crawl over me again, but the officer's voice pulled me away. You, you're that boy. I never thought I'd see you again let alone recognize you. Yeah, I haven't been here since it happened. Felt like I had to stop by, I said, peering through the lights at him. Well, I'm sorry I gave you such a hard time. I'm sorry about your friend. People like to come out here and cause trouble. The park was never the same after that, and once everyone moved out, it was a hot spot for squatters and the like for a while private property and the owner calls and raises hell every time he sees people out here. I understand you're paying respects, but I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I'll, f I'll follow you out, he said and started to leave. Without much to say, I just nodded and rolled up my window. The officer started walking away and I watched his silhouette shrink in the side mirror as he made his way to his car. When he reached the door, he stopped, his hand pausing as he reached for the handle. After a moment, he turned around and started walking back. I waited for the mustached face to come into view and rolled the window down again. Hey, kid, he asked, his brow furrowing a little. Yeah, I said. The air was feeling chillier, a light fog rolling over the road. The sight of it made me sick to my stomach. Back then, when the accident happened... And I arrived at the scene. You kept saying the same things over and over. Green trailer, lady in the woods, he said, leaning on the door. I remember, I say. But I'm not looking at him anymore. My eyes are held ahead. Are you sure that's what you saw? Are you sure that's what happened? He asked, and I could feel him studying my face positive, no doubt in my mind. Why? I asked, looking to the side of the road, to the darkness beyond the headlights. When we arrived, there was no trailer. There wasn't any woman in the woods, either. I asked every resident in the park, nobody saw anything. We searched for miles, maybe thinking you were right and someone had fled the scene. Even got a helicopter. Did you find anyone? I asked, gripping the steering wheel. Nobody. Ah. In the dark, I traced the faint outline of something ahead. Rectangular in shape. But here's the thing. After talking to all the neighbors, we spoke to the landlord. 
When we mentioned what you said you saw, he turned white. Almost fainted. And said it was impossible. Said he'd been running the park for over 20 years, and in all that time there had only been one green trailer. In the 80s, he said, and paused to chew his lip. A young couple used to live there. Pretty young woman with a drunk for a husband. Whenever he wasn't sunk in a bottle, he was getting into drugs. Always late with rent. Always yelling and screaming at each other. He said sometimes when they fought, he would beat her up pretty bad. She would walk around the loop waiting for her husband to calm down or fall asleep. Said she would ask for help from the neighbors, knocking on doors as she went. They helped at first, but it happened a lot, he said. But she would always go back home. They would make up and things would get quiet for a while. But it would always get bad again. Back then, it was a different time. Police didn't do much to help her, I'm afraid. After a while, they stopped taking her calls. Not long after that, the neighbors stopped helping altogether. It was just a thing that happened. The fog started to get thicker, but the officer didn't seem to notice. One night after an especially bad fight, he beat her up real bad and left. Took the car and left her there. Landlord said she came out eventually, limping, her face all swollen, mumbling his name as she walked the loop in the middle of the night, waiting for him to come back, I guess. But he never did, and she kept walking, even after everyone put their lights out for the night. When morning came, she was gone. Through the fog, I could see the outline of windows and the rectangular shape, and the dark structure of a porch. Police found her on the highway, hit and run. Nobody knows if it was grief taking hold or if she was just trying to catch a ride into town. Afterward, they pulled the trailer from that lot and never put another one on it. Never allowed another green one, either. I thought of Kirsten's scream and the floating ball cap. Look, kid, I, I don't know what you saw that day, but I'm sorry about the whole thing. And I'm sorry you lost your friend, the officer said, and patted his hand on the hood awkwardly. Do you see it now? I asked, pointing forward. The officer raised his eyebrows and looked into the distance. I watched as his face softened with worry, and his eyes narrowed on what lay ahead. Without a word, he grabbed his flashlight and aimed it in the yard. With a faint click, the beam cut through the dark and he panned it slowly around the property. I watched it shine over the fog and shine on a familiar, dingy green paint. Ratty, stained drapes. And a mangled figure at the end of the yard. Well, don't see anything, kid, he said and shut off his flashlight. I looked into the darkness, transfixed on what I knew was still standing there. Me neither. Sorry for causing trouble. You have a good night, officer. I said and started rolling up my window. He looked like he wanted to stop me, but in the end he stood there and let me go. I drove past the empty lots and rusty mailboxes, keeping my eyes forward until I was through the winding road that led out of the park. I didn't realize I was holding my breath until I was turning back onto the main roads. Once I was out, the icy feeling withered away, and I was welcomed by the comfort of green traffic lights. As I left the park behind me, I released my grip on the wheel and felt the tension in my shoulders melt away. I sighed exhaustedly, keeping my foot on the gas until I made it to the clover leaf that led me here. I took the ramp quickly, knowing the highway would overlook the park and ultimately take me home. I don't know why I took that way. Whether it was just me being defiant, or maybe I just felt like I had to. Or maybe, inside the safety of my car, I thought I would be alright. Merging onto the highway, I sped onto the overlook and could see the empty park and its wooded sanctuary. Below, I could see the slow-moving headlights of the officer leaving. The fog and trailer were gone, and with it, the mangled woman. I returned my eyes to the road, 
just in time to see a hitchhiker walking on the shoulder. They walked slowly, leisurely kicking rocks as they went. As I approached, they stopped and looked at me, slowly waving as I rapidly approached. It was a little girl with a freckled face and a red ball cap. When I checked the rear view mirror, she was gone. We had reached cruising altitude, and the passenger airplane I was sitting aboard was sailing turbulently through the sky, riding on air currents, and exploiting physics in ways that I would never understand. Maybe it was my ignorance of these things which made me so nervous. My leg bouncing up and down and making the seat rattle with constant vibrations. My teeth had even been chattering for a while before takeoff. But now my nerves had settled down to a dull roar. Are you sure you're all right? The white-haired man sitting next to me asked, his hand settling on my arm in a comforting way. Should I call the stewardess over? She can get you some water or a cup of tea to calm the nerves. A little shot of brandy, too, maybe. <laughs> he laughed, gripping my arm just a little too firmly now. I'm fine, I said. The worst of it's past. As long as we don't run into engine trouble or something, I should be okay. That statement caught a few angry glares from passengers nearby, who quickly went back to reading or talking amongst themselves. I scolded myself internally for saying my worst fears out loud. Nobody likes to think of engine trouble when they're flying over the Atlantic Ocean in the middle of the night. Well, let's not speak of those things just now, the old man said. Do you want a book to read? I brought a spare novel. He showed me a novel with an airplane on the cover, flying straight towards a mountain. No thanks. How about some television? I think they have cable on these little things nowadays. He pointed at the screen on the headrest in front of me. I hadn't even noticed it there. That's a good idea. Maybe I can find something to distract myself. I turned the power on and noticed immediately the lack of sound. Of course, I'd forgotten to bring headphones. Here, the man next to me said, handing me a pair of his own. I'm not using them right now, you can borrow them. They were the kind with the foam pads on the outside of the headphones, not earbuds, so I felt relatively safe using them, even though I am a bit of a germaphobe. At least we wouldn't be swapping earwax. Thanks, I said taking them and putting them on, plugging the cord into the headphone jack. A squeal of feedback caused me to recoil, and I turned the volume down, finding it had been set to maximum. The man was speaking again, and I pulled back the headphones to hear him better. Anything I can do to help. I used to have a terrible fear of flying, you know. But after you do this a few times, you start to get used to it. I smiled weakly, feeling nauseated from not eating. I hadn't been able to stomach breakfast that morning, or any other meal for that matter. It had been over 24 hours since I'd eaten or slept due to my nerves about flying. Putting the headphones back on, I began to flip through the channels on the little television set in front of me. Discovery Channel came on, and I decided to leave it there. It was a show about the Amazon rainforest, describing ancient civilizations which resided in the jungles. Using new technology, LiDAR, they had found the outlines of massive cities which had housed millions of ancient Amazonians, their gods and their myths lost over hundreds of years. I was watching this as the man sitting next to me began to remove something from his bag. It was a Tupperware container, I realized, with a scratched and faded red lid on top. He opened the lid and an odor more foul than anything I had ever experienced wafted out, hitting me in the face like a punch to the nose. It smelled like old, rancid seafood. Like a dumpster which had been sitting open in the hot sun, full of used diapers and bad shrimp. The man produced a fork from his bag and lifted the container to his nose, closing his eyes as he savored the smell. Using his hand like a fan, he waved more of the stink towards his face, like a gourmand about to eat a Michelin-star meal. 
Despite my own disgust, I couldn't help but steal a glance at what was inside the container. It looked like a trout had been tossed into a food processor, bones and all, only it hadn't been blended for long enough. There were still obvious pieces of bone, scales, and a fish head which could be seen left partially intact. A bulging white eyeball was prominent among the pieces. The old man dug in his fork and took a large bite, going for the eyeball first. I heard it squish between his teeth and explode in his mouth. Black, viscous fluid dribbled down his chin, landing on his shirt. I couldn't believe nobody was complaining about the smell. Nobody else seemed to even notice, except for me. If not for how nice he had been to me, I would have said something. The stink was really starting to make me feel sick. He saw me looking and dug his fork into the mess, then held out a large, heaping bite for me. I could practically see the stink lines coming off of it. Do you want to try some? He asked, his yellow teeth showing as he smiled. That grin, somehow predatory and leering, made me second-guess everything about this man. Suddenly he didn't seem nice anymore. He was mocking and cruel, his previous niceties just a facade to hide his true nature. And what an actor he was. No thanks, I said, gulping down a lump of bile in my throat, trying to force a smile but failing miserably. I, uh, I just ate before the flight. He looked at me as if staring directly into my soul. Then he shook his head as if saying no, like he didn't believe me. He sucked his teeth and went back to his meal. Shouldn't lie to me, you know. I pretended not to hear that and went back to looking at the television, trying to distract myself from the scene happening next to me. But my heart was thumping fast now and I could feel a throbbing pulse in my jugular. My leg was bouncing up and down again my palms sweaty enough to leave wet marks on my knees as I tried to hold them still. The Amazon Rainforest History Show was finished, and now something else was on. It was a show about aviation disasters. How planes malfunction before crashing. A voiceover was speaking about horrible tragedies and near misses, showing computer-generated images illustrating the critical parts of the airplanes which had broken. Then they switched to the passenger footage, which had been recorded on people's phones during troubled flights. During this Air Asia flight, severe turbulence resulted in the hospitalization of more than five passengers, as the plane was eventually rerouted to Tokyo. The screen showed images of a plane's interior, shuddering up and down violently and sending people flying into the ceiling and into the aisles. Women and men could be heard screaming, as luggage cascaded from overhead compartments and people prayed for safety. One person was seen tumbling down the aisles as he was thrown from his seat. I was on that flight, you know, the man next to me said, licking his gore-smeared fingers clean. One hell of an in-flight meal, let me tell ya. I tried turning off the television, but it didn't work. I tried to change the channel, but that button was broken too. It seemed to be stuck on this particular program, and there was no way to get rid of it. Finally, I tore off the headphones and unplugged them, handing them back to the man. You don't want to watch anymore? He asked, slurping up some of his roadkill casserole. Maybe the book would be a better distraction. No. No. Thanks for letting me use your headphones. I think I'm just going to try to take a nap. Suit yourself, he said, crunching a bone between his teeth. I'll wake you up for meal service. How he could still be hungry was a mystery to me, especially after he had just ingested such a monstrous dinner. I was already beginning to suspect that there was something off about this man. The way he had changed was unsettling, and I felt like I was suddenly in the twilight zone. He just wasn't acting normal. So I watched him out of the corner of my eye for a while, trying to convince myself he was just a bit odd, and nothing to worry about. He was just an eccentric with a very unusual diet. Eventually, I managed to convince myself that was true, and despite my unease, my tiredness won over everything else, and I fell asleep. I didn't remember my dreams, only waking up to find myself completely alone on the plane. The hateful man sitting next to me was gone, but so was everyone else. 
The plane was still rumbling turbulently through the air, but now with no one in it. I looked outside and saw the sky was clear and bright blue instead of night like it had been. But we were flying towards a dark thunderhead, booming with lightning up ahead in the distance. The storm front looked to be ten miles high and a thousand miles wide. A swirling, dark mass of angry weather. A category fucked hurricane that would take out a city without warning. I stood up and looked around the plane, still not understanding how it could be empty. Where had everyone gone? How long had I been out? Had they allowed me to sleep right through deplaning? Before I had another moment to think, the plane bounced up and down with a sickening yo-yo motion, then careened to the side. It did this a few more times in rapid succession, pitching forward and backward so that I was thrown off balance and sent tumbling into the aisle. By the time it settled again, I wanted to puke, but at least the plane had leveled out again. I stood up from the floor and glanced out the window. I saw we had just passed into the massive thunderhead, and the inside of the plane was suddenly pitch black. There was a voice whispering from all around me, speaking my worst fears aloud. Black, inky tendrils like smoke began to reach out towards me from the shadows. You're all alone. The plane is going down. It will sink in the middle of the ocean. Freezing, drowning, water in your lungs. Falling, dropping, plunging from the sky. You know you're going to die. I stumbled forward down the aisle, moving towards the cockpit. They needed to turn this plane around. How could they not see it? The interior panels of the plane on both sides suddenly made loud, rending noises, as if the craft were beginning to break apart at the seams. The walls bent inward, exposing the insulation, and a sound like a giant pop can slowly being crushed could be heard from all around me. The thunder crashed loudly outside, and the panels pulled further apart until I could see the howling wind and rain and saw it blowing into the cabin. Lightning flashed, and I could see it through a gap in the side of the plane, which grew even wider before my eyes. It's going down, I yelled, stumbling forward. We're going to crash. The plane dipped and climbed upwards in a sickening way as we hit another pocket of turbulence. My heart was in my throat, my stomach doing backflips as I lurched down the aisle, holding onto the backs of chairs for support. Finally, I managed to reach the door of the cockpit. There were no flight attendants or passengers that I could see, but there had to be someone flying this plane. I began to hammer on the door, screaming at them to let me in. It's going down! I screamed again and again. I heard laughter coming from the darkness all around me as I yelled at the captain hiding behind his steel door. Once again, I found myself on the floor being tossed around in the turbulence as we hit another rough patch. I put my hands over my head and tried to cover my face as the plane's fuselage began to come apart and the wings began to break free from the body. Looking up, I saw the door to the cockpit was now open and there was no one sitting inside. The pilot and co-pilot seats were empty. I staggered to my feet to right the controls. As the moment I saw inside the cockpit, the plane began to plummet from the sky. It went into a nosedive, and I was once again thrown backwards into the aisle this time by the force of multiple G's. I flew through the air, tumbling and careening into seats and debris as I was pitched backwards towards the back of the plane, waiting for the impact, knowing it would be the last thing I would ever feel. I was screaming when I opened my eyes and found myself staring up at the faces of dozens of anxious passengers all around me. The flight attendants looked less anxious and more upset as I had just ruined their quiet flight with what appeared to be a total nervous breakdown. To the other passengers, it had appeared that I was sleeping, then collapsed into the aisle, screaming about the plane crashing. I would have believed it was just a nightmare, too, if not for the bruises I would find all over myself. Bruises left from my time being tossed around by the turbulence on the plane. Several concerned passengers and crew ushered me back to my seat, where I was momentarily left alone again with the old man and his yellow teeth and horrible appetite. You made quite a scene back there, he said, picking his teeth with a toothpick. It was so real, I muttered. How did it feel so real? He didn't answer. Instead, he began to speak about another topic. You know what's funny about fear? He asked. 
The question was hypothetical, so I just looked at him and waited for his answer. The funny thing about fear, at least when it comes to you humans, is that it doesn't work well if it gets dumped on you all at once. You need to get scared, then feel like everything's okay. And then you can get scared again, even more. But you start to feel desensitized to it if it comes at you non-stop. That's why horror movies have highs and lows, moments of build-up and tension before the jump scare, a roller coaster of ups and downs. The man's belly was swollen and one of his shirt buttons popped off, flying into the seat in front of him and clicking loudly off the television screen embedded there. He looked full, fat, happy and satisfied for the first time since I'd met him as if he'd just eaten a huge meal. Gears were turning in my mind as I looked into his glossy black eyes and began to understand who he was, or at least what his motivations were. Just as I suspected, he was not a man at all. Bright lad, he said as if he'd just read my mind. I had a feeling you'd figure it out. It was you. The voice in the empty plane. You made me think it was real. And then you fed on my fear. You dined on it like that disgusting shit in your Tupperware container. Ah, but fresh is always better than leftovers. I thank you, though. I haven't had a meal like that in quite a while. Your terror was so deep and so strong. What the hell happened to you, anyways? I winced as if slapped, remembering my parents. Somehow I had a feeling he already knew about them. Why else would he ask? Maybe he wasn't as satisfied as he looked. I hit the call button and waited for a stewardess to come over. Then I asked her if I could switch seats. I told her I'd sit anywhere, as long as it wasn't next to the disgusting old man sitting beside me. I think he's a demon, I said. Look, I know how that sounds, but hear me out. The flight attendant gave me a worried look, as did several other passengers sitting in the vicinity. The woman cleared her throat and leaned in, speaking low under her breath, in an attempt to salvage what was left of my pride. Sir, the seat beside you is empty. I've been watching you throughout this flight, and there's nobody sitting there. You've been alone. And to be frank, you've been talking to yourself quite a bit. It's starting to worry some of the other passengers. I stammered something, looked at the old man, was unable to turn away from his wrinkled face and yellow teeth pulling up in a widening grin. It's my responsibility to alert the captain of this and have you returned home to America for a psychiatric evaluation. You've got bruises all over you. It's obvious you're not able to care for yourself properly, based on your behavior during this flight. You're a danger to yourself, and possibly to others. An air marshal was sitting nearby and stood up, removing a pair of handcuffs from his belt. I I've heard enough, and I agree with your assessment, miss. I appreciate your patience with this man. He is obviously very unwell. Despite my protests, which quickly turned to screaming, he handcuffed one of my wrists to my seat. Luckily, this plane is on a return trip to America after just a couple hours layover here. So we'll be back up in the air in no time. The two of them walked away, leaving me alone with the fear-eating demon sitting next to me. His true form was slowly beginning to show through the cracking facade of his human appearance, and I could see the rotting hell flesh beneath. No, 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 no. Please, don't make me go back. I don't want to go back. I'll take a boat. Let me take a boat. Just anything but this plane. You need to get me off of this plane. Don't worry, said the old man, drool cascading out from his lower lip. They used to be scared of flying, too. But after a few times, you'll start to get used to it. Thank you for watching tonight's video, listening to tonight's story. Hope you enjoyed. 
This story was previously featured on the Dr. No Sleep podcast. I'll include a link in the description below if you want to check out his uh, podcast and YouTube channel. Uh, this story is also featured in my new book, which is just being released. Uh, it's actually available on Amazon now, and it's titled From the Darkness. There'll be a, a link in the description below if you want to check out the book. And this is a collection of short horror stories all written by me. There's a bunch of stories in here that have uh, been on podcasts and one story that's never been seen anywhere else before. Um, so if you enjoy my writing and you want to uh, support my work and, and purchase a copy of my book, hope you'll check out the description below or check out Amazon for the book From the Darkness by Jordan Group. Thanks everybody for listening. Most old lighthouses have been turned into useless remnants of the past. New technology, modern ships, and GPS have made them almost obsolete. Not in my town, though. Our old lighthouse is still very much operative, and watched over by an old lighthouse keeper. Every night, the light beam is moving over the surface of the ocean until the sun comes up. My town is a small, remote coastal town in northern Germany. Only a few thousand people live here, and we scarcely get visitors. It also isn't too far-fetched to say we are a bit behind. I graduated school with barely average grades. For the first two years, I worked here and there to earn some money, but it was never anything substantial. It was earlier this year that I found out that the old lighthouse keeper was retiring. Of course, someone was needed to replace him. It wasn't exactly my dream job, but at least it would be a permanent position. I visited the old man, Mr. Wallace, right away, and told him about my interest in the job. Somehow I must have made an impression on the old man. During the interviews, he singled me out between the candidates and told me he'd give me a chance. On my first official day, the old man and I met up in front of the lighthouse. I was first to arrive, and noticed the old man from afar. He was walking in my direction, dragging one of his legs behind. A limp, I thought. Once he reached me, he handed me a cup of steaming liquid. For you, he said with a bright smile. The wind today must be getting to you, boy. Thanks, I answered, taken a bit by surprise. The old man took a deep sip from his cup, took out an old key ring, and stepped towards the entrance door. This thing is a bitch to open. He started to turn the key around, but the door didn't budge. Come on, you bloody... Ugh. Finally, there was a loud clang as the door sprang open. You coming? As I followed him inside, I noticed how dirty and narrow the lighthouse was. When I was a kid, it had been this imposing, grand building. Now I saw that it was pretty unimpressive. There was another door opposite the entrance. The old man didn't address it at all, and instead began his ascent up the stairs. Before I followed, I took a sip from the cup he had given me. I almost spat it out again. This wasn't coffee as I'd expected. What the hell's that stuff? Grog. Warms you right up, doesn't it? I frowned, at which the old man started laughing. You'll get used to it. The old man had quite a hard time with the stairs. He had to almost drag himself upwards. Must be the leg. No wonder he's retiring, I thought to myself. I heard him wheeze and groan as he clung to the railing. A few times, he had to stop to catch his breath. You okay there, Mr. Wallace? Do you need a hand? I've been making my way up these damn stairs for half a century, boy. I'll be fine doing it a few more times. Once we made it upstairs, the old man showed me around. Better get comfortable around here. You'll be spending a lot of time in this room. As I looked around, I saw an old radio system. Other than that, there was a table, a few chairs, a telescope, two cupboards, and a small oil stove. The rest of the room was empty. There was a metal ladder that led up from here to the lantern room above. Ain't much need to get up there the old man said, except to give the thing a checkup before it turns dark. With that, he motioned for me to follow him upstairs and showed me how to make sure the lamp was working. It didn't take long, and soon we were back down again. There ain't much to do up here, 
Keep watch till morning. Make sure everything goes well. So, do you get many calls up here? There aren't many ships coming to town anymore, are there? With that, I motioned to the old radio system behind him. Haven't gotten a call in years. There ain't no one coming here. And if they ever do, it's in those new modern ships. They don't need no lighthouse anymore. And why are we even here? Doesn't it mean this place is useless? I mean, not like I'm complaining or anything. I can... This place ain't useless, boy. Now you listen, you listen close. You don't know what's out there, do you? It ain't those ships that need us, it's the town. For a moment I looked at him before I burst out laughing. Okay, you almost got me, I said. The old man frowned. I ain't joking around, boy. Yeah, sure, I thought. But I kept my mouth shut. Now, here's the thing about my town. You could say it has a history. Over the decades, a number of strange things have happened. One such story is about a fishing boat that went out one morning with a crew of eight. That same evening, the boat returned, but without any sign of the crew. The men stayed missing. Another tale is about an artist who decided to paint the moonlit sea. The next morning, they found the man babbling nonsense. He had gone mad overnight. By now, natural explanations have been found for almost all of these stories. The artist had a history of mental illness. The fishing boat most likely got caught up in a storm. Back in the day, though, these stories fed into people's superstition. Over the years, they became local legends. There are many people in this town, even today, who believe in the supernatural. From the way the old man had talked, I could tell he was one of them. Who was I to blame him, though? After half a century up here, I'd most likely tell myself similar things, hoping to give meaning to what I was doing. There's one more thing I gotta show you. With that, he made his way down the spiral staircase again. Once we reached the bottom, he opened the door I'd seen before. This here's the generator room, he said as he led me inside. This lighthouse is old. The cables and power lines are, too. When it storms a little too much, the power can cut out. If that happens, you turn on this baby here. With that, he pointed at the generator. That light has to stay on. At all times. Then he showed me in every minute detail how to handle the generator. Turn this here and that there. If this happens, you need to add some oil. And if that happens, the fuel is empty. If the light doesn't turn on once you start it, check the cables. This went on for almost half an hour, and multiple times he asked me if I understood him. Once he finished his explanations, the old man told me he'd stick around for the first couple of nights. He'd show me the ropes, he said. The three nights he stayed at the lighthouse with me were quite all right. I had expected the old man to be somewhat uptight and boring, but he wasn't at all. He cursed like a sailor, knew an endless amount of dirty jokes, and had quite a few stories to tell. He even brought some booze. It was to keep the mood as merry as possible, he said. One of the things he did first after arriving was to give the old generator a checkup. After that, he made his way up to the lantern room to do the same to the lamp. His diligence surprised me. On the last day, I told him I'd be sure to pay him a visit in time. He said that, instead of making empty promises, I'd do well to remember what he told me on the first day. Whatever happens... Always make sure that light is on, boy. On my first day alone, I made sure to follow the old man's routine to the point. First the generator, then the lamp, and then everything else. Everything else pretty much meant the radio system. To be honest, I had no idea why we even kept bothering with the damn radio. There'd been nothing but static on it, and I doubted it would change anytime soon, if ever. The first night alone was terribly boring. For a while, I rearranged the room to my liking, and then cleaned it out a bit. Unfortunately, this could only fill so much time. The rest of the night I was sitting in one of the chairs, staring out at the dark sea. I played around on my phone for a bit, but without any reception, there wasn't much to do. I cursed at myself for not bringing anything else. I'd not make that mistake twice. For the first two weeks, I was serious about everything. 
I was new on the job, after all. Once routine settled in, though, things changed. Nothing had happened so far, and I was sure it would stay that way. Quite a few times, I turned the radio's volume up in the unlikely case of an emergency, and settled in for a nap. At other times, I brought my laptop and spent the night watching movies or TV shows. To be honest, I felt a little bad about it. I'd been on the job for a good month when the first power outage occurred. A terrible storm was raging, and when the power turned off, I went down to the emergency generator. In the room, I could hear the raging of the storm, the shrieking of the wind, and the waves crashing against the beach. It's one hell of a storm, I thought. The power outage lasted until early morning, long after the worst of the storm was over. The second power outage came out of nowhere. The lights flickered and soon went out completely. Again, I made my way down to the generator. Again, I heard sounds from outside and wondered if a new storm was coming up. Soon, the rattling of the generator replaced the sounds. This time, the power outage didn't last for long. After not even half an hour, I was on my way back down to turn the damn thing back off. What a complete waste of time, I cursed to myself. I turned the thing back off, locked the generator room behind me, and made my way back up. Once I was up again, I slumped down in my chair. Why did I even go to all that trouble? Not like it mattered anyways. It wasn't like any ships would crash. For the next couple of weeks, nothing happened. Then, one night, the power went out again. Oh, come on, really? I was watching a movie on my laptop, and I wasn't in the mood for getting up and making my way down to the generator yet again. The power would most likely be back on in an hour anyways. Not like there was a storm or anything. I had one look out at the sea and saw it was completely calm. I turned the movie back on, but after a while I started to hear something. At first I thought it was part of the movie, but when I paused it the sound was still there. It was a low melody or a type of wordless singing. I looked around the room for the source of the sound, but found nothing. It couldn't be the radio, could it? Wasn't it off due to the power outage? I went forward, but before I could reach it, the weird singing got louder. It must be coming from outside, I realized. As I turned to the window, I saw that the calm sea had turned into raging waves. What the hell? How did the sea change so quickly? Then I saw something emerge from between the waves. I stepped to the telescope and used it to see what was going on. As I focused the telescope, the first thing I saw was dark hair. What followed was white skin that shimmered in the moonlight. I gasped as I finally saw a face. It was the face of absolute beauty. Soon I could see the naked, upper body of a young woman above the waves. I stumbled back from the telescope, shook my head, opened and closed my eyes and looked again. She was still there. Is that a... mermaid? It couldn't be. Mermaids weren't real. But then, what was I seeing? As I watched on, more started emerging from the sea. They all were swimming towards the beach. All the while, the sea was raging around them. I wondered how these frail beings were able to move so swiftly and carelessly in the choppy sea. Suddenly, a flare was fired into the sky. It illuminated the sea into glaring red light. The beings in the water recoiled from it. They were screaming and shrieking, throwing themselves backwards. Before I could wonder who had fired the flare, I saw something horrific. Now, their beautiful faces and perfect bodies were replaced by a nightmarish reality. Where I had seen beautiful mermaids before, I now saw bloated, fishy monstrosities. There was no hair or skin anymore, just scales. There were no beautiful faces, just empty, staring eyes. Where I had seen smiles before, there were now giant jaws that opened to rows of fangs. I watched in utter fear as those gigantic creatures burst through the waves and water alike. I was glued to the telescope, watching in utter horror. Then the light of the flare died away. The monstrous beings transformed back into beautiful mermaids. Yet again, they were frolicking in the water. 
This time, though, the illusion wasn't perfect anymore. My brain had seen reality, so it refused to discard it altogether. The beautiful faces of the mermaids were disfigured by maws filled with fangs. Their bodies were still shimmering in the moonlight. Now, though, they were bloated and disgusting. For a few seconds, I stood there dumbfounded. From what I could see, there were more and more of them appearing in the water. Then my grip on reality returned, and I remembered the words of the old man. You don't know what's down there, do you? It ain't those ships that need us, it's the town. It finally dawned on me. It must be those things he'd been talking about. They recoiled at the flare. The light was to... to keep them out? As this thought crossed my mind, I realized the terrible mistake I'd made. If not for the flare, I'd never... I rushed to the stairs. Taking multiple steps at a time, I made my way to the generator room. I tried to open the door, but it was locked, as always. I reached into my pocket and tried to find the right key. The noise outside grew louder as well as nearer. I couldn't concentrate. All I had on my mind was the image of the monsters out there. Any moment now, they could reach the beach and with it this lighthouse. There was no singing anymore. Now I only heard loud roaring. As the door sprang open, I hurried inside and tried to turn on the generator. Nothing happened. What the fuck? Why aren't you working? I kicked it and tried again, but nothing happened. And I was starting to panic. I tried again and again, and then I remembered the oil. Since the last power outage, I'd not checked the thing at all. Oh, why the fuck now? Why the hell? I was cut off by a noise from outside. It's just your imagination. It's just your imagination. There is nothing... Something hard and sharp scratched alongside the out of the sturdy metal door of the lighthouse. I froze up. I held my breath. Each second turned into an eternity. Once I was sure that everything was quiet, I dared to breathe again. Right at that moment, something heavy hit the door, and I could hear one of those things roaring from outside. It was only a few meters away. I rummaged through the shelf to find the oil. Where the fuck is it? It's gotta be here somewhere. Fear had overtaken me completely. I looked at the shelf but wasn't seeing anything. My eyes wandered from left to right and then to left again. There was nothing there. My eyes grew wide and I winced as another bang hit the door. Something was trying to tear its way through the metal. At that moment I saw the bottle of oil, but as I picked it up it slipped right through my fingers. I cursed again and picked it up once more. I started to pour the oil into the generator. Sweat dripped from my forehead. My body was shaking. I spilled more than half of the oil. Would the light even do anything? The flare worked, but if those things are already out of the water, what if... I didn't get to finish the thought. The banging and tearing at the lighthouse door stopped. Moments later, I saw the doorknob turn. The image of the old man locking the door each morning appeared in my mind. He held the key in his hand, put it into the keyhole, and turned it twice, giving me a nod. You never know who shows up out there. I hadn't locked the door. I hadn't locked it in weeks. I stood there, but couldn't move as I heard the door open. For a moment, slim, feminine fingers pushed themselves between door frame and door. Then reality replaced them and I saw a claw-like hand rip the door open. Right at that moment, the bloated body of one of the fishy abominations appeared outside the door. In the dark of the night, I wasn't sure what I was seeing. There were too many appendages. It looked to me as if it was a grown-together mess of various creatures. I saw legs and arms, but also fins and gills. The body itself was long and more muscular than I would have thought. I tried to start the generator again, but nothing happened. The monstrosity roared at me, this time so loud that my ears were ringing. I saw its dead eyes focus on me. The jaws started to open and close in anticipation before it slithered forward. Then it started to squeeze its body through the door. As the massive body came closer and closer, I tried the generator again and again. Long, scaly appendages shot forward, clinging to the door of the generator room. As it dragged itself forward, inch by inch, the generator finally rattled to life. With it, the lights of the room and in the stairway flashed to life. The abomination roared and screamed up in pain. It raged and yanked itself backward to escape the light. The stare of the empty, fishy eyes rested on me the whole time. They promised that the thing would return one day and it would drag me back down into the dark depths that it had come from. 
and then the creature vanished. I threw the door shut and locked it. For the remainder of the night, I sat shivering in the room at the top of the lighthouse. I sat there, covered in a blanket, shaking and scanning the sea. Thankfully, I saw nothing. Even at dawn, I didn't move. After more than an hour, I started to go through the old man's routine. It wasn't my sense of duty, neither was it diligence. It was fear. I pushed the moment when I'd leave the lighthouse off as far as possible. In my mind, the thing was still out there, waiting for me. For a long time, I contemplated if I should just stay inside. After I had checked the outside from the top of the tower more than half a dozen times, I decided to leave. By now, it was past eight in the morning, and the sun had been up for more than three hours. Everything was normal outside. Nothing reminding me of the abomination I had seen. On my way home, I noticed a commotion near the beach. As I got closer, I saw the police were there as well. I pushed myself through the crowd to see what had happened. The sand in front of me was splattered with blood. In the middle of it was a covered up body. Must have been torn to pieces, I heard one of the police officers say. Then I noticed a flare gun lying next to the corpse. Who, who is it? I yelled to the police. At first they ignored me, but finally one of them came towards me. He recognized me as the new lighthouse keeper and took me aside. The name he told me made my heart drop. It was Jeremy Wallace, the old man. I later found out that even though he had retired as the lighthouse keeper, he still went out to the beach every night. Even after he gave up his job, he had still continued to keep watch. He must have been concerned when the lamp of the lighthouse turned off and didn't come back on. Once he saw the beasts closing in on the beach, he must have used the flare gun to ward them off. Once the light of the flare died and the light of the lamp didn't return, those beasts must have come after him. I remembered his limp. There was no way he could have gotten away. If I'd only turn on the light earlier. I thought back to the flare. Without it, I'd never even recognize what danger I was in. These beasts might have very well entered the lighthouse and torn me to pieces. Not only that, they might have gone for the town as well. Tears of frustration came to my eyes. While I had ignored my duty, it was this old man who had saved us all. And he had done it at the cost of his own life. Since that day, I often catch myself thinking of the old man. Now that I know what is out there, I never sleep or take my job lightly anymore. I don't bring anything to read. Instead, I am busy making sure the lighthouse is in prime condition. I often use the stove to heat up grog. At first, I drank it only to keep the memory of those days with the old man alive. But in the end, he was right. I'd get used to it. We all knew when they sent us to Mars that we could die here. That we were 300 million miles away from help. And there were at least that many ways for us to perish in this windswept and rock-strewn wasteland. But none of us could have imagined this. Even the most absurd simulations run by NASA statisticians did not account for this turn of events which we have witnessed. There were four of us initially. We arrived on the Red Planet five years ago. A top-secret cooperative mission between all the space-capable governments of the world. The math had been checked and rechecked, and there was a consensus among these nations that Earth was not going to survive the next hundred years. We had to begin our migration to the nearest livable planet, and for it to have any chance of success, that migration had to begin immediately. Terraforming takes time, after all. It was decided that there was no sense in alerting the general public to the extreme urgency of this plan, and that the hastily assembled mission should be kept a secret. The Red Planet was barren and empty when we arrived here. Our shelters, though superbly engineered, could not withstand the punishment of the windstorms on the surface. After some time, it was decided out of necessity that we would need to dig down, to create tunnels that would serve as shelters and temporary habitats. Supplies were sent from Earth to facilitate this process. 
After a lot of work and some terrible mishaps along the way, we managed to create a bunker beneath the ground where we have set up laboratories and living quarters. We have a minimal supply of power and the ability to make fresh water and recycle air. We receive some provisions once a year, but other than that, we're mostly self-sufficient. I keep saying we. Really, it's just me now. Something happened to the rest of them. There's something else on this planet with us. Something that's residing just below the surface. We were digging yesterday, trying to expand our cultivation area. It's slow work since it requires taking every scoop of soil up to the surface, but we managed to clear out a decent amount of space over time. Any sections being expanded are sealed off from our artificial ecosystem, so we were in our spacesuits while working. A door which sealed off our underground bunker was behind us, and we had managed to create a room about the size of a bachelor apartment. Once we received another load of supplies, we could set up the walls and ventilation, the lights and air supply, to make this another livable space where we could take off our bulky suits and helmets and walk around freely. At present, that sort of space was at a meager minimum. Kate was swinging her pickaxe against the wall, breaking off chunks of loose rock. The ceaseless ringing sound of metal on stone was echoing and constant in the dim space. Once upon a time, I had found it annoying, but I was so used to it now that it didn't even register. It helped that on Mars, sound didn't work the same way. Things were duller, quieter here. The headlamps on either side of my helmet illuminated a wide region in front of me as I worked, shoveling rocks into a wheelbarrow. Everything else was blanketed in darkness. Even on the surface, light was only a third of what it would be on Earth. Underground, the darkness was actually oppressive. It felt like you were drowning in it. Suddenly I heard a noise like the wall had just caved in behind me, where she was standing. A loud showering of rocks falling over suddenly, and I wheeled around to see Kate was gone. Just gone. I moved as quickly as I could in that direction, maneuvering in the low gravity with my bulky suit encumbering every step. Running over to where she had been, I called for help asking the others in the main living quarters to come quickly. There was a hole in the rock where Kate had been. When I finally got close enough to see what had happened, I looked through the gap and saw a vast and dark cavernous space behind the rock wall. My headlamp shone through, and I looked down to see Kate struggling on the treacherous terrain where she had fallen. She had slid a little ways down a steep hill made of crumbling dirt and rocks. The loose ground was slipping beneath her feet as she attempted desperately to gain purchase. I need some help, she cried, trying and failing to find her footing. The angle was so steep that she was clearly struggling, trying not to show the terror on her face. I got you, Kate. I tried, my words sounding false to my own ears. Just hang on. But I saw that she couldn't hang on. She was being swallowed up by the blackness below. More and more by the second... She was almost ten feet down the slope now, and too far for me to grab her. Then fifteen feet, then twenty. Bring ropes and climbing equipment, I called to the others in the habitation unit. Double time, guys. Hurry, Kate's in trouble. They responded affirmative on the radio. I watched horrified as she slid further and further down into the darkness below. Hang on, Kate. Now, guys, we need you out here now. Behind her, I could see there was a huge underground cavern. My lamp could not illuminate far enough to see the floor or the other end of it. The dark space had to be massive, considering the NASA headlamps were top of the line. The high-powered beam of light cut through the blackness for a ways and then was swallowed up. When I looked down again, Kate was gone. She didn't respond on her radio either. The sound of her impact to the floor below did not come back up to me, and I imagined her falling slowly in the low gravity at first, her descent quickly increasing faster and faster until she reached a deadly velocity, and then it wouldn't matter anymore how forgiving the gravity was. But the sound of her impact never came. Way and Reed came out from the airlocks with ropes in hand, looking at me with concern. I waved them over and pointed down into the blackness below. The section's hollow. She broke right through with a pickaxe. She fell in and couldn't climb back up. It's all crumbling rock, so I think she must have slid right down. How far, I'm not sure. 
Captain Reed seemed to consider the options. Time was of the utmost importance. If she was still alive down there, her air supply would be limited. We all stared through the hole into the blackness and looked up to see the roof of the cavern far above. It was very odd, since our bunker was next to a large vertical rock face that we had always assumed was sturdy and solid. Now we realized the giant mountain of stone right behind our base was hollow, like the fossilized skull of an ancient colossus. It seemed unnatural to my eyes, but I'm no geologist. Way quickly went in to call base. As I looked down helplessly into the dark abyss of the cavern, Hello, Nathan, are you... The radio crackled with static, but I could hear her voice in my helmet. Kate, are you okay? Can you hear me? There was nothing for a few moments, and then I heard the static crackle again. Yes, hear you. Can you? I waited, but there was only silence once again. You're cutting out, Kate. How far down are you? We can lower a rope. Something down here, Nate. Can't explain it. Pool of water broke my fall. Kate? Did you say water? Nothing after that again for a few minutes, despite trying again multiple times. We all stared at each other, dumbfounded. The average temperature on the surface of Mars is approximately minus 46 degrees Celsius. It was much colder than that in the caverns where we were located, away from the sun's warming rays. Far too cold for liquid water. We were protected from the deadly radiation present on the surface, though, and that was the major benefit of being below ground. She must have a concussion or a head injury. Somebody's going to have to go down there, I think. I'll go. I volunteered immediately. Putting on the climbing harness, I tried to put one leg at a time through the loops of woven fabric, the way I had done a thousand times, but still I found myself struggling. My hands were shaking, and I couldn't get my fingers to work properly. Finally, I got the damn thing on and attached the other clips and ropes and equipment to my suit. Reed handed me two climbing axes as well, just in case. I lowered myself slowly over the side of the steep cliff edge and made my way down. The darkness surrounded me on all sides as I went deeper and deeper down, feeling suffocated by blackness. I had to remind myself to breathe. It felt like I was descending forever downwards, as the light above got dimmer and eventually disappeared entirely. The walls looked yellow and strange, veiny and organic when I shone my lights on them, but I didn't have time to stop and look and just assumed it was an unusual type of rock formation. As I dropped down further, my head began to feel light. My vision suddenly blurred for a moment and I had trouble seeing. Then it cleared again and my ears began to ring painfully. I didn't understand what was happening. And then began to hear voices whispering in my ears instead of ringing. Until it seemed as if they were right inside my mind, speaking to me. But in a tongue I did not understand and that was not human. Oh, that can't be right. Finally, Kate's headlights became visible. I saw she was standing down below and was touching the surface of the rock wall. But it was not a rock wall, I realized with dawning apprehension. The wall was moving and shifting. They were all covered with yellow web-like formations that I saw everywhere. All over the floors and walls and ceiling of this unnatural chamber. So close to me I could examine them as I finished dropping down to the floor below. The yellow webs looked familiar for some reason and it took me a few moments to realize why. The yellow web-like formations were almost identical to slime mold, one of the most curious and interesting life forms on planet Earth. Of course, not known to exist on Mars. Coincidentally, I knew a thing or two about the stuff. Slime mold is not a fungus. It's not an animal or a plant. It is separate from everything else on the Tree of Life, almost as if it has its own Tree of Life. Despite the fact that it grows to be very large, up to several feet in diameter in my experience, but nothing like this, it is a single-celled organism, except with millions of nuclei, and is potentially capable of some form of intelligence. In labs, they have found that slime mold can solve mazes, for instance, and they grow extremely quickly. They can expand and contract like the muscles in our own bodies, using a vaguely similar mechanism. Thinking about these things in the back of my mind, I couldn't help but feel afraid as my feet touched the stone floor, and I saw the yellow slime was on me immediately, quickly growing and expanding onto my boots, moving much faster than anything seen on Earth. 
I called out over the radio to Kate once again. She was standing right in front of me, but did not turn around. I began to approach her and looked down to see the strands of yellow webbing sticking and stretching from the bottom of my feet. It was like walking across a movie theater floor covered in gum, each step difficult and taxing. Finally, I reached her and put my hand on her shoulder. She spun around quickly and I saw her eyes were surprised and blinking, as if I had just woken her from sleep. Kate? Can you hear me? Oh. Nathan. Hi. There was a crack in the glass of her helmet, and some of the yellow slime mold was oozing around it. With dawning horror, I realized that it was actually inside her helmet, moving around and exploring the space in there. Some was on her neck as well and in her hair, and I nearly gagged with unexplainable revulsion at the sight of it on her. Kate, you have a breach in your suit. We need to get you back to the hab. We can't go yet, Nathan. Look at all this. She was speaking softly as if she was sleepwalking. Her voice a lilting lullaby. Everything she said in a sing-song tone, quietly and at a whisper. I wanted to ask her why she was talking like that. Why she wasn't listening to common sense, but more than anything, I just wanted to get away. I know that must sound awful, but part of me wanted desperately more than anything. Just to get the hell away from her and away from that yellow slime mold looking stuff that didn't belong there. Kate, we have to go now. Please. Come on. They're talking to me, Nathan. Do you hear them too? If you listen closely, you can almost make out the words. I'm even starting to understand them, Nathan. I tried to grab her arm and she pushed me away, turning her face to look at me angrily as she did so. Don't touch me. Turning around, I saw the pool of water that she had described falling into. It was not water at all, but a large deposit of the yellow slime mold in a large crater nearby, bubbling and moving around. Whipping tendrils stuck out from it curiously and darted around, seeming to inspect the air. Bring me back up, I said over the radio. Kate's refusing assistance. There's some strange organism down here, and she's... She's, uh... Not done with it yet. Or it's not done with her. They didn't seem to hear me over the radio, so I simply pulled twice on the rope and they began to reel me back in. It didn't feel right leaving Kate down there, but I told myself I didn't have a choice. We'd have to regroup and come up with a plan. Maybe she would listen to Reed if he went down and ordered her to return. The darkness swallowed her up beneath me, and I looked down at my boots in dismay to see that the yellow webbed slime mold was hanging on to me still wriggling and squirming and exploring my legs. It appeared to be searching desperately for a way into my suit. Bewildered and confused, my mind grappled with a hundred different scenarios, still in shock over what we had just discovered. There was life on Mars. Disgusting, slimy, potentially telepathic life. But still, for the first time in history, it had just been irrefutably proven beyond any doubt. I had just witnessed a never-before-seen breed of what I assumed was slime mold growing in the depths of the cavern. Somehow it was still alive and thriving despite extreme temperatures and an absence of any known food supply. The whole thing existed beyond science and logic, and yet it was there. My crew wouldn't believe me, I thought to myself, if not for the remnants of it clinging desperately to my boots. They hauled me up through the opening in the rock and immediately began to ask why Kate was not with me. She refused to come back up. There's something down there, some kind of organism. This stuff, I said, pointing at my boots. What the hell is that? Wei exclaimed. She was normally calm and composed, but now she was backing away, stumbling over rocks and shaking. I can hear it in my head. Reed began to look concerned as well, and I remembered how something similar had happened to me as I descended down into the cavern. I had nearly dismissed the voices in my head as my imagination and fear until Kate confirmed she heard them too. Oh yeah, that. Just just wait, it'll pass, I said, hoping it would as it had for me. After a few long moments, it did. What the hell are we dealing with here? Reed asked. I only wished I could give him an answer.
The three of us went back inside for a brief rest and to regroup. Wei went straight to her lab with an odd look on her face, saying she would examine the slime mold and try to give us some answers. She would also communicate with home base from there and explain the newest developments since she had an uplink in her lab. Reed and I stood pacing in the habitation unit's kitchen, dining room area, debating what the hell we were going to do. Kate had refused to come back up with me, and I told him she didn't seem to be herself. It was like the slime mold was telling her to stay there, and she was listening. I didn't understand it, but there it was. We can't convince her to come up, right? Which leaves us exactly one option, as far as I'm concerned. We hitch a rope to her suit and drag her ass back up here. I don't like it, but it's what we gotta do. After a bit more discussion, the two of us decided I would go down again while Reed stayed up top since he was the strongest. It was easy enough to pull a person up in the low gravity, but two was another story altogether. If necessary, I told him I would wait down below while he pulled Kate up, and then he could send the rope back down again afterwards. Going down into the darkness again was even more terrifying than the first time. Even though I knew slightly what to expect, the whole thing was going wrong. I could tell already when I heard Wei's voice speaking over the radio. She was speaking in a whispering lullaby tone, the same as Kate. We don't need to bring her back up here, Captain Reed, she said. Tell Nathan to come back up. I don't understand. Can you repeat, Wei? She must stay down below. Mother is hungry and must eat. Mother must become one. I didn't like the sounds of that one bit. Reed, you need to bring me back up. Way's compromised. She's talking like that thing's controlling her, like it was controlling Kate. She's coming out here, Nathan. She's got a knife. Oh, God. Get back. Get back. Stop. Please, wait. Listen to me. He cut out abruptly. The rope I was holding suddenly began to drop in sickening lurches. I fell ten feet, then twenty, feeling sick as I bounced back up with a sudden tension. Gravity pulled me back down, and I held onto the rope desperately feeling I was about to die for certain. Beneath me the ground came into view and I saw Kate's light now shining dimly from the wall, but I did not see her. The rope dropped again as Reed was attacked by the thing above. The thing that had once been Way now clearly trying to kill him, judging by the sounds of it and judging by how he was holding the rope, or not holding it. This time I fell all the way to the floor below, slowly at first, then faster and faster as the ground sped towards me. I landed awkwardly, twisting my ankle and called out in pain. Looking over my shoulder, I saw the rope was still there, hanging from the cliff above. So Reed was still up there, hanging on for dear life and fighting off Way or whatever she had become. I only hoped he was alright. Then I turned around and saw Kate, or what was left of her. She was enveloped by the wall she'd been standing in front of when I left her. Her face stared out at me and I saw the yellow web slime was now covering her eyes and nose. It was in her ears and worst of all it went into her mouth like an intubation device going down her throat. Blackish yellow veins lined her face and neck and her entire spacesuit was wrapped in sticky yellow web slime which held her fastened tightly to the wall. Despite my terror I found myself stepping forward, wanting to help her still, somehow wanting to do the right thing and get her out of there. If only I could clip the rope to her suit. At that thought, the webbing seemed to unravel and released her like a Venus flytrap letting go of its prey, like a flower opening in bloom. Though her face was covered with yellow slime, she walked towards me as if she could see me plainly through it. The oozing web stretched out behind her as she came at me. And that was when I realized the voice in my head telling me to stay and try to save her was not my own. It was a foreign voice speaking in a close approximation of my own thoughts, telling me not to worry, telling me to remain calm, telling me to stay and become one. I ran instead. The rope was still there and that was enough for me. I grabbed onto it and began to climb, my feet walking up the side of the steep vertical cliff as quickly as I could. I didn't dare to look back but knew that Kate was just behind me. Not Kate, but what was left of her. Struggling up the sheer 90 degree slope, I found myself tiring more and more. The wall seemed as if it was grabbing onto my feet and wrapping them up in webs with every step I took, getting stronger and pulling harder all the time. The strands of yellow slime grabbed on and refused to let go. 
snapping in half with only a great effort on my part. I pulled myself up the rope and walked up through the living muck as it tried tenaciously to hold on to me. All the while, as I walked up the wall, I heard whispering in my mind, louder and louder now. Every so often I would find my hands beginning to let go of the rope without any conscious effort on my part, and had to fight off the voices and tell myself to hang on. Even though they spoke in a language unknown to me, it seemed not to matter, as their will was made known to my mind and I had to fight from bowing to its growing power. Finally, I reached the top and pulled myself back up into the light. The habitation unit was visible just ahead, and I saw that the rope was tied off haphazardly to the door handle. Captain Reed was lying on the dirt floor of the underground space where all of this mess began. His helmet was cracked and his face was bloodied, but he was still alive. Wei was lying on the ground next to him, a knife protruding from her chest. I had to, he began, seeming unsure how to continue. She came at me, tried to kill me. I barely managed to get the rope tied off. With dawning horror, I realized I had not pulled the rope up after me. I ran over to the ledge and looked down to see Kate climbing up. She was only a little ways down, the yellow slime mold covering her eyes and mouth like a slimy, yellow-webbed bridal veil. Terrified, I backed away, realizing there was no time to cut the rope or stop her. She was almost at the top. As her hands grabbed the ledge, I looked down to see Captain Reed telling me to go, telling me to run. I hurried inside through the airlock and slammed the door behind me. I hastily took off my suit and ran over to the computer to change the access code for entry. Luckily, I was quick with the keyboard and managed to secure the only access point, just as the creature that was once Kate started to hammer on the door. I looked out through the small window and saw her, covered in yellow slime which writhed and pulsated. The webbed mold was growing everywhere now, on every surface she touched. It expanded outwards at an alarming speed. It spread over Wei's body and I saw it break off her head at the neck like a drumstick from a chicken. Hungrily, it dove in through the bottom of the helmet and began to consume. With incredible strength, other parts of the web slime wrapped around her legs and broke them apart at the joints. The white bone, muscle, and blood spilling out before being devoured. As the mass continued to grow and spread, malignant and out of control, it reached Captain Reed. His face was a mask of terror and I held the door with white-knuckled fury, unable to turn away as it broke him in half. The yellow tendrils broke his ribcage open and gushed in like a wave crashing on the beach, taking everything. In my headset I could hear him screaming until very suddenly I couldn't anymore. Turning away, I slumped down to the floor and sat, waiting for it to be over. I've been trapped inside for quite a while now. I sent a communication back to base and everyone thinks I've gone insane that I've killed the rest of the crew and am now trying to blame mind-controlling space mold. As if I couldn't come up with a better story than that. I mean, really. The soil is toxic here. The air is unbreathable. There are a million and one ways to die here if I needed to find an excuse for the death of my crew. Hell, I'd find a better one than this. Luckily, one or two people believe me. They've agreed to get this out there, at least in some fashion. As for me, I wait. It's already inside the habitation unit. I was too careless when I took off my suit. Now it's starting to grow all over. Starting to spread. It's on me now. Moving up my legs, my fingers and arms. Fine tendrils of yellow branching out slowly and insidiously infecting me, making me part of the one. It tickles my throat as it spreads spore-like downwards, like a black mold growing quietly in a dark, wet corner of a bathroom. It grows. The thing that was once Kate watches me from the window in the door, waiting, whispering. In my mind, she's whispering to me right now in a sing-song tone telling me to open the door. And all the while, it's spreading. Can you hear it? The first manned mission to Mars began well enough. 
launched without the knowledge of the general public. It lasted for almost a decade, silencing the naysayers in NASA and abroad. It was by all measures a success, until a series of unfortunate events occurred. These unexplained phenomena brought the entire project to a crashing halt. All contact was lost after nine years of successful habitation on the Red Planet. Something tragic had happened to the crew, and at least one of them had seemingly gone insane. It was suspected that science officer Nathan Flanders had killed the rest of the astronauts on the mission, and had taken his own life following his final transmission. That's where the four of us came in. We were sent to conduct a salvage operation, and tasked with surviving against all odds on the barren planet's surface. Instructions were to use what we could from the old base. The multi-billion dollar array of advanced equipment was invaluable, and some of it was reportedly irreplaceable. Our flight and landing on the surface went well, proceeding without incident. Despite all that, our nerves were on edge, and the four of us were jittery with anticipation as we made our way from the landing craft to the hatch, which led to the underground habitation unit. The area surrounding us looked surprisingly similar to Earth, a desolate desert region scattered with flat rocks and boulders, and a sheer wall of rock that jutted out from the ground upwards stood just behind the old habitation unit's coordinates. We bounded toward the hatch, stumbling awkwardly in the lower gravity. I felt occasional moments of success when a step forward was executed just right, but otherwise my ambulation was awkward and clumsy. I fell over at one point and bounced back up after a couple attempts. There was a smile stretching across my face, though, and I looked over to see Denise was doing the same. We couldn't help it. We were each fulfilling a lifelong dream, and despite or perhaps because of the tension of the situation, we began to grin like idiots and laugh. Finally, we reached our destination. Raymond pried open the hatch door. Dust and sand poured off the flat surface as he heaved it open. Clearly, it had been a while since anyone had gone down there, into the pitch blackness below. The possibility that anyone was still alive in the habitation unit was unlikely, if not impossible, but we had been prepared for nearly any situation. There had been enough food and water supply for the entire crew to survive, and we were told there was a slim chance we would need to defend ourselves, if compromised crew members were still alive down there. Last contact had been with Nathan Flanders, the failed mission's science officer. He had claimed there was something down below, in the area being dug out for the base's expansion. Some sort of organism. And he said that it had infected the crew. He had called it telepathic slime mold, according to reports. Ridiculous, of course. Nothing could live in the freezing temperatures of the caverns beneath the surface of Mars. It was far too cold for that but the rationale of that specific delusion made some sense. Flanders had researched slime mold extensively during his formative academic years, so it seemed to follow logically that he would revert back to thinking about it during a mental break. At least that was what the psychoanalyst back at base thought. That there was some traumatic event underlying all of this that he had failed to disclose on his psych report. As we climbed down into the habitation unit, I began to suspect we had been wrong to think he had been lying that we had been wrong about everything. Whispering voices were speaking in my mind, but I dismissed it as nerves and adrenaline, my overworked mind playing tricks on me. The darkness was total as we descended the ladder. By the time we got down to the floor and switched on our headlamps, it was too late. The hatch slammed shut above us automatically, and we looked around in horror to see the controls to open it up again had been covered by yellow, slimy webbing that writhed and pulsated as if alive. It was disorienting and surreal, and for a moment I felt like a fly who had fallen into an elaborate, labyrinthian spider web. It surrounded us in spiraling whorls that enveloped everything in a many-stranded mass of stringy, striated slime mold. All of the habitation unit and its high-tech interior was covered with the stuff. It was built up on the walls and on the ceiling, covering the floors and leaving only the ladder and the small space around the base of it open, as if waiting for us, 
not wanting to alert us of its presence until it was too late and we were trapped. The yellow webs writhed and moved all around us, reaching out tendril-like toward us from the walls and stretching out to touch us. Oh my god, what is this? I heard Aisha whisper breathlessly through the radio. He was right. It wasn't a delusion. It was all true. We need to get out of here. Now. The captain ignored me, moving forward despite my objections. Yo, hang on, said Raymond. We have to see if we can salvage anything. Maybe we can do something to get rid of this stuff. At the mere mention of that, the slime mold began to whip itself into a frenzy. A piercing, ringing noise invaded my mind, and my ears felt like someone was stabbing into them with sharp pins. My knees buckled from the pain, and I nearly fell to the floor, but the sensation subsided a few moments later, and we all relaxed. Why do you not seem the least bit phased by all this? I asked Raymond, suddenly suspicious. It felt like he was the only one not even remotely surprised by the fact that Nathan Flanders had been telling the truth. There really was life on Mars. And it wasn't human. The three of you would have never come if you'd known the truth, he said under his breath. His words were in a monotone, not sounding like himself at all. Besides, it was classified. You knew? I shouted at him in a rage. How could you bring us here knowing this mind-controlling slime was real? As I spoke, the yellow gunk was stretching, spreading and climbing up my boots towards my ankles. I tried to push it away with my hands and it got stuck to my fingers and expanded, rapidly growing up my hands and onto my wrists. We need to get out of here, I said, no longer caring what he was going to do. We need to get back to the ship. To do what? We need this place. There's no way the four of us survive here without the equipment in this HAB unit. It took over a decade to set all this up. We just came here to try to pick up the pieces, remember? You want to give up on that already? When he said it like that, I had to think twice. You have a plan, right? Something you didn't tell us about? Another secret you kept from us? A grin spread across his face. Damn right I do. Try not to think about it too much, though, since we're not alone in our minds anymore. Try to think about something else. Golf or something, okay? Just don't get thinking too hard about what I might be planning to do. This slime stuff ain't gonna like it. I nodded, resigned to follow him a little further. We had come this far, after all. We continued deeper into the narrow confines of the habitation unit. The webbing reached out and I felt it touching me in places outside my suit, moving towards my helmet. But I tried not to panic. I noticed Aisha had the same calm demeanor as Ray, and wondered if she knew what we were in for as well. Do you think it's possible that Nathan is still alive? Denise asked, her voice shaking. Doubtful. Movement came from up ahead and I saw something in the shadows. A shape lurching forward. The thing which came out from the next room clearly once was an astronaut. But it was not Nathan Flanders. A voice rang clearly through my mind. And I heard it was a woman softly speaking. Her tone was musical and lilting almost sing-song. I found myself wanting to go to her as I listened, and looked down to see the webbed slime moving up my leg further now, almost to my midsection, crawling up my body and encasing me in it. I tried to back away but found it was difficult to move now. The yellow gunk was becoming more tenacious, gripping me and holding me in place like vines. Won't you stay with us? Be one with us. Don't you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself? She asked inside my mind. Her face came out from the shadows, and I saw now that her entire head was covered with the yellow webbing. It reached in from a crack in the helmet, and had spun itself around her features like jaundiced cotton candy. A mask of it covered her face, but it was translucent enough to see through in places. The tendrils of yellow slime webbing had enveloped her body, and it carried her across the floor toward us as if she were floating upon a cloud. What did you do to the rest of them? I heard myself asking aloud. We needed nourishment. It was such a long sleep. But now we are well fed and looking for more hosts. If you want to live here, 
This is the only way. If you prefer to die, that can be arranged as well. Raymond was reaching for something in his bag. I tried not to think about it too much, what he was planning to do. He pulled out a weapon of some kind. I had no idea it even existed or had been brought on the journey. But then again, no one had told me we would be fighting for our lives against mutant telepathic slime mold either. The horrifying web-covered astronaut who was coming toward us was close now, only a few meters away in the confined space. Ray squeezed the trigger and the gun let out a blast of reddish-white light like a wide laser beam. It went past our attacker, missing wide. She was closing in now, pissed, the webbing bringing her toward us like a wicked chariot. He fumbled in his bag for something and pulled out a small square box. Pushing a button on the gun, it ejected a smoking cartridge, and I realized he was reloading, but he had almost no time. The horrifying creature was almost within striking distance now. Slamming the fresh battery into its slot, he pulled the trigger just as the web-covered astronaut thing was mere inches from him. The blast ripped a hole through the center of the creature, and she let out a piercing scream which ripped through my mind. It took several minutes to quiet, but still lingered like my ears were ringing. Ray pulled another fresh battery pack out from his bag and changed it for the old one. It seemed the gun was single fire and needed to be reloaded after each laser burst. Still, it was a formidable weapon. Another top secret military project, I guessed. The possessed astronaut woman was lying on the ground, twitching and writhing, moaning in pain. Raymond walked over towards her and pointed the weapon at her head then pulled the trigger once again. At point-blank range, it obliterated the head of the possessed astronaut, putting her out of her misery and stopping her never-ending torment. I shuddered at the thought of having my body controlled by a parasitic creature, controlling me like a puppet. This horrifying mental image rattled me badly, especially when I looked down at my hands and feet to see them being covered by the exact same stuff. Enough, Ray. We're lucky to be alive after that. Now can we please get the hell out of here? Raymond looked me in the eyes and loaded a fresh battery into the gun. Not even close. We have to keep moving. We have to get to the source of it. I have coordinates. We'll be down in the caverns below the hab unit. Are you insane? We don't even know if there is a source of this madness. And even if it does exist, we'll never get to it. Look at this shit. It's all over our suits. Pretty soon it'll be covering our visors. We won't be able to see anything. We're going to die down here like the last crew. We gotta get topside now, and if we're lucky, maybe the sun will kill the stuff for us. Suddenly, the slime mold sprang to life again, whipping its tendrils at us and then starting to squeeze my legs painfully like boa constrictors. I tried to lift them up and turn around, and felt like I was stuck in molasses. It took every ounce of my strength to turn away from him and start heading back towards the ladder. If you two want to live, I suggest you come with me. He's got a death wish. I muttered over the radio to the others as I moved past them in the confined space. They looked hesitant to leave Raymond alone down there. Before I could get away, the webbing reached out and grabbed me with long tendrils from behind and started wrapping me up like vines. It went under my arms and around my waist, then around my neck trying to squeeze the helmet off my head so it could get to my flesh. It's got me! I screamed. Help! Denise grabbed a blade from the supply bag she was carrying and went to work sawing at the tendrils that had wrapped themselves around me. Hang on, I got you. Meanwhile, Aisha moved past and caught up with Raymond, her face looking hurried and uncaring of my predicament. Leave them, Raymond said to her, and she nodded. They stepped over the astronaut's corpse and continued through the hab, towards the back, where it led to the caverns, to the source. I screamed at them, cursing them both, Knowing now they had been aware all along. They had both been briefed on what had really happened here. Things that I hadn't known about until just then. Denise was cutting at the ropes of webbing that were holding me there. But every time she cut one loose, another grabbed hold. It's hopeless, I said to her. Just go. Get back to the ship and tell them what happened. Tell them this place is a lost cause. It's a death sentence for anyone who comes here. Her face was still determined, her eyes focused. She finally got one of my arms free and handed me the knife, grabbing another from her belt. I'm not leaving you, so just shut up and cut. I turned my body away from the wall as she cut the strands, holding my waist free. Now it was only my one arm that was still wrapped up in the webbing. 
It pulled at me and crushed my arm painfully as I tried to pull away. Screaming, I cut haphazardly at it, hacking and sawing with reckless abandon. Denise was cutting out another large piece, and although more had begun to wrap me up, we had the upper hand now. Slashing at them with every ounce of energy we had, I finally managed to pull myself free. See? Told you. Denise said, smirking. Now come on, let's get out of this hellhole. We were both semi-covered in the yellow webbing, which was now feeling heavy and cumbersome on our legs and hands as it expanded and purposefully slowed us down, resisting our every movement. The control panel was covered in the stuff, but I remembered suddenly from my training there was a manual release on the hatch door. It had been installed in the event of a power failure. I managed to reach the ladder and look back down to see Denise just behind me. Beginning to climb was difficult, the yellow slime mold sticking to my boots and sucking me down like wet cement. With an extreme effort, I got my boot on the first ladder rung and began to climb. The hatch door wouldn't open at first. It didn't help that I was terrified and full of panic, suddenly forgetting all of my training. I began to slam my fist against it, mad with fear and unable to focus. Slime mold was climbing up my visor now, covering it so I couldn't see. My breathing was coming fast and I found myself hyperventilating, feeling like I was drowning in it. Finally, my fingers found the hatch and I pulled on it, feeling the satisfying click of it opening. Sunlight spilled in as I swung it open and climbed up into the air. The yellow webbing began to retreat from the light, recoiling and peeling back from my visor like it was melting. It preferred the darkness. Denise and I managed to get back to the landing craft. We got back inside after making sure we had gotten rid of all the stuff from our suits. Immediately, we sent a transmission back to base, explaining what had happened. After waiting a long while, they answered back. Any word from Raymond and Aisha? Did they set off the device? You would have felt a tremor like a small earthquake. So that was their plan. Some sort of device to destroy the stuff at its source. I still didn't understand why they didn't just tell us the truth. But then I supposed I wouldn't have gone if they had. Perhaps the device was some sort of bomb that would make the organism inert and harmless. Or maybe Raymond and Aisha were going to sacrifice themselves to set it off. Either way, I was glad I had gotten out in time. I responded back to base. No, we haven't heard from them yet. And we haven't felt anything yet. But then, a moment later, we did feel something. An explosion from beneath us. The ground caved in below the landing vessel and we were thrown to the wall as the entire landing craft plunged down into a huge sinkhole that had just been created. When everything settled, I opened my eyes to see Raymond and Aisha staring at us through the window of the landing vessel. In the darkness, the yellow slime mold still covered their suits. It was on their visors now and had found its way inside and onto their faces, into their eyes and mouths, nostrils and ears. They were being controlled by the parasitic slime mold now. It was governing their actions, and they had used the device designed to destroy it to instead bring us down below into the darkness where we would be vulnerable to it. We held the doors closed as they pulled on the latch, trying to get into the ship. There was a steel rod which we managed to wedge the door closed with, at least for now. Still, it won't hold forever. I can already see the yellow webbing sneaking in through the edges of the door, punching through weak points in the hull, and growing vine-like into our living space. It is spreading and moving toward us steadily, to our cramped spot in the corner where we watch them encroaching. There's still people at NASA who want the public to know the truth, to know about this cover-up, they said they'll get this out there for us, one way or another. Because they know as well as I do. The Red Planet is damned. And the human race should never return here. Have you heard of the Charnel Man? No, I say, stuffing a croissant down my gullet and chasing it down with scalding coffee. I choke and sputter but clamp a hand over my mouth so I don't lose any of the $4.99 breakfast I just paid for. And I don't have the time today, Jerry. I'm late. I wave thanks to Agnes, the old barista behind the counter, but she's distracted by a couple of girls. 
They're singing some dumb nursery rhyme. Probably from a TikTok video. We're all late for something, Jerry says. And his eyes do that funny thing where for a single second I swear that they gleam. But it's probably just a trick of the light. Are you sure you haven't heard of him? He asks. The Charnel Man? I wipe breadcrumbs from my chin and start heading for the exit. No, nope, never. My hand touches the doorknob and I pause, trying to focus over the shrill chorus of the girls singing. All of a sudden, the name sounds familiar. Is he in that new Marvel movie? Jerry shakes his head. I shrug, pull open the cafe door, and leave. Work is long. I spend my morning filing reports and checking boxes on forms that look identical. Then I take a short break to contemplate killing myself over lunch, before getting back to it in the afternoon. Sometime around 4 p.m., my phone vibrates. New text. Unknown sender. Hello, it says. Who's this? I message back. No response. Good. I like it better that way. At 8 p.m., Netflix asks me if I'm still watching The Office. I tell it I'm not, and pull myself off my broken sofa. Outside the apartment window, I hear the sound of rolling sirens and junkies arguing in the street. I decide it's probably time to put my head down. My phone vibrates. New text. Unknown sender. The son of the master is bleeding. I take a few seconds to stare at my screen, my eyes running over the words. It's the same number that messaged me earlier. I pick up my phone and steady my thumbs over the keyboard, wondering how on earth one even responds to something like that. I settle on, who the fuck is this? All roads lead to Vermilion. I board the bus for work and it smells like piss and heroin. A pretty woman in a small skirt and blouse asks me for the time, and I tell her it's 7.02 a.m. She looks familiar. She smiles and asks me if I've ever thought about slitting my throat. I blink. A word falls out of my mouth, and I think it might be no. She sits down across from me and pulls a butter knife out of her purse. Her thin fingers run along the edge of the blade. She mutters something over and over. A name, maybe. Matthew. Matthew 4, 8. At the next stop, she gets off and tilts her head to the sky. The knife finds its way to her throat, tapping against it like a metronome. And as the bus rounds the corner, she glances my way. In the distance, I hear screaming. I'm sorry, but I asked you to check these boxes, not these ones. My boss slaps a stack of paper on my desk taller than the Burj Khalifa. He's running his hand through his blonde hair. He's shaking his head. This is becoming a problem, he says. It's code for, I'm going to fire you soon. I recheck the proper boxes. This time I don't even make it to lunch before I contemplate leaping off the top of the building. I take out my phone to check the time. New text. Unknown sender. Undo that which binds us. I rub my eye, standing up from my cubicle, and glance around. Somebody in the office is messing with me. My eyes find Bill. Thirty-nine years old, twice divorced. More bitter than an orange peel and half as attractive. His computer screen is covered in spreadsheets and numbers. His phone is in his hands. Prime candidate. My vision drifts down, zeroing in on his phone. There's something on the screen, but it's hard to make out at this distance. A video, maybe. It's moving fast, a mess of colors. Bill takes a look around. His tongue darts out across his lips and he repositions himself in his chair. He slips a hand into his pocket. The video's perspective shifts. I see a naked woman surrounded by six men, all of them grinning ear to ear. Except the woman's eyes are dead. A man steps forward, reaching for his crotch. My phone vibrates. New text. Unknown sender. God won't hold you at the end. There's a knock on the side of my cubicle, and my boss is there, chewing gum like a camel. How are those spreadsheets coming? He asks. 
I look down at the pile of papers I just finished. Something boils inside me. You didn't ask me to work on any spreadsheets, I say through gritted teeth. You wanted me to recheck the boxes on these forms. A moment of dead air hangs between us. I see his expression flicker into a smile before coming a frown. Oh, sorry, he says. I actually asked you to get those finished by four. He drums his fingers along the cubicle wall. You know, I really don't think this is going to work. Have your things cleared out by eight tomorrow. It's raining on the way home. I pass a homeless man on the street, and he reaches out and grabs me by the arm. I recoil, and words escape me. They're not pleasant, but he doesn't mind. Have you heard of the Charnel Man? He asks. My eyes settle on the face behind the rain-soaked mop of hair. It's familiar. Desperately so. Yes, I say. You told me about him two days ago. At the cafe. Jerry smiles and his blue eyes gleam a little. Except this time there are no flicking lights to play any tricks. He gets up from his cardboard mat and digs into his rusted old shopping cart. I want to show you something, he tells me. I want you to make a choice. I hug myself and shiver. I've just been fired from the only career I've ever known. And all I can think about is how much I hate the weatherman for not warning me it was going to be raining so hard. What sort of choice? I ask. Jerry pulls two objects out of the cart. He grins at me and his teeth are yellowed. What few are left. He holds out his hands. In one of them is an old sneaker so worn down that its tip has separated from its base. In the other is a dead bird. I bring a hand to my mouth, stifling a wretch. Jerry, I say. Why do you have that thing? It's disgusting. He doesn't respond. His eyes are gleaming again and his smile is so wide that it's splitting his face in half. He shakes the sneaker and the laces jingle and the tip and base waggle like moving lips. Then he shakes the bird. I hear something snap inside of it. I pull away and my feet are moving on their own. I'm walking backwards, shaking my head, staring at Jerry who's still standing there, beaming in the downpour with hand-me-downs and dead things in his hands. He reminds me of somebody I know. He calls after me, but I barely hear him. It sounds like he's saying a name. Matthew, maybe. When I get home, my apartment is a mess. It looks like somebody's been there, rifling through it, looking for something. My drawers are pulled out, the cutlery is scattered across the linoleum. My cupboards are swinging in the breeze of the open window, and the plates and cups are everywhere they shouldn't be. My feet crunch against smashed ceramic and broken glass. It smells like whiskey. Outside, I hear sirens. They sing a chorus with arguing junkies and the pitter-powder of falling rain. It's rhythmic. It's soothing. It's cold. My eyes find my laptop on the living room table, and it's open. The login screen reads three failed attempts in bright red text. My phone vibrates. New text. Unknown sender. They soak our eyes with gasoline. I need answers. My fingers steady against the screen of my phone, my body alight with the slow pulse of adrenaline. I tap the letters one by one. Then I hit send. It's a question. That's all. Why? There's a sound from my bedroom, scratching, breathing. I investigate. My footsteps groan against the carpet, my heart assaulting my ribs as I press the door open. The hinges squeal. My eyes gaze into the black of the room, not quite illuminated by the dim light of the hallway. Something shifts in the darkness. The scratching stops and something growls. I flick the light switch and my room is suddenly bright and empty, untouched. The bed is unmade, the closet's closed, the garbage is overflowing. 
Nobody is scratching. Nobody is growling. My phone vibrates. New text. Unknown sender. We dance with broken feet. Something crashes down the hall. I tear myself from my bedroom, moving down the short hallway toward the flickering light of my television. When did I turn that on? I shake my head, stepping into the living area, ready to confront the junkie that broke in looking for some spare bills to get his fix. There's nobody there, though. It's just the weatherman on the television. Droning on. We haven't seen weather like this in four, maybe even eight years. What a storm! He's filling the airwaves with excuses. Talking about how the rain couldn't have been predicted. About how it wasn't his fault. And about how he definitely shouldn't be fired. I reach for the remote. Don't touch that dial. The weatherman's tone is different. It's changed. I gaze up at the television and it's like he's staring straight at me. He reaches under his desk and pulls out a pencil. He studies it for a second or two, then shrugs. This one's for you, Matt. He slams the pencil into his eye and the television goes blank. But not before a torrent of blood spills onto the table and his body convulses in shock. Elevator music plays over an icon that reads, Technical Difficulties. My phone vibrates. New text. Unknown sender. Calamity is our birthright. Something crashes against the window. I turn in time to see a crow's face smeared against the glass before it drops from view. A moment later and it appears again a short distance away, wings beating furiously against the storm. Its beak is broken. One of its eyes is hanging from its head. It soars toward me. The glass shatters and the bird rolls across the living room carpet, staining it with blood and rain. The crow twitches and caws. I raise my sneaker to put it out of its misery, but before I do, I make sure to look into its eyes. The one in its head and the one hanging by a thread. It's a force of habit. Why? My phone vibrates. New text. Unknown sender. All flames end in ash. Wind and rain rush through my window. The apartment is filled with the sound of sirens, junkies, and lies. I bring a hand to my head. I close my eyes. Somebody's knocking on my door. Hammering on it. Fuck. I get up and peer through the peephole. It's the pretty woman from the bus. In the smart blouse. I thought she looked familiar. She must have lived down the hall. I pull away and unlatch the deadbolt before swinging the door open. A question on my lips. She's gone. A man is standing there. Jerry's holding a worn-down shoe and a dead bird in his hands. A crow. Smiling, so wide that it's splitting his face in half and his eyes are gleaming. Have you heard of the Charnel Man? He asks, and a cockroach squirms out of his mouth. I slam the door in his face and stumble backward onto the floor. My phone vibrates. New text, unknown sender. The skeletons are waiting. The scratching starts up again, but this time it's vicious, desperate. It's coming from my bedroom. There's a voice, but it's barely there. It's gurgling, it's groaning. I crawl on my hands and knees, my body trembling as I reach the doorway to the room. The closet shudders. There's something in there. It's on the other side, and it, it wants to get out. I lurch onto my feet, my eyes wide and pulse hammering in my veins. Footsteps are tiny. I move inches at a time, dragging myself forward. The groans escalate into shrieks, into screams, and my hands grasp the closet door. I pull. My phone vibrates. New text. Unknown sender. This is your kingdom. A fly lands on my face, and I smack it. More buzz around me. I swat them away, stepping back, and as I do, I hear the low whine of rusty wheel bearings. My eyes find the open closet. It's opened up into an alley, dimly lit by the yellowed street lamps above. There's a shopping cart framed beneath the light. It's stuffed with three corpses. Their skin is pale. 
Flies have made homes inside their ears and eyes. I fall to my knees, something boiling inside of me. I recognize the faces. I know them. The first is the woman in the smart blouse, and her throat is split apart, and maggots are spilling from the gap. The second is my boss. His blonde hair is missing, scalped from his red skull, but he's still got that stupid fucking smile on his face. The last is the weatherman. His eye socket is filled with a number two pencil and dribbling blood onto his suit like he doesn't have a care in the world. I slam the closet shut. Vomit coats my bedroom. I hurl until there's nothing left inside of me. Until even the acid of my stomach runs dry. I mutter the word no over and over. I mutter it as if it's some great and mighty spell that might somehow bring them back. But it doesn't. So I move on to the word why. Footsteps groan on old floorboards. I turn around and it's a familiar face with yellowed teeth and gleaming eyes. He's smiling so wide that it's splitting his face in two. His voice is familiar. Too familiar. Why not? He says. It's what you wanted. I open my mouth to scream and ashes fall out. Here you are, a dark roast. I blink and my room is gone. The smell of dead things and maggots and rotting corpses vanishes, replaced by the thick scent of fair trade coffee and organic deodorant. A little old lady is holding a steaming cup toward me. It's Agnes. Apparently, she's 74 years old. And don't forget this, dear, she says, pressing a croissant into my hand. You enjoy your morning now. I fish into my pocket for my credit card, but all I find is a bloody pencil and a crumpled piece of paper. There's a name written on it. Matthew. When I look up, Agnes is waving a hand at me. You know better than that. We only pay what we can afford around here, Jerry. She offers me a wink before approaching two young girls singing a shrill nursery rhyme. My eyes find my reflection in the cafe windows. I'm wearing a tattered jacket and torn shoes with a mop of gray hair and yellowed teeth. I raise a hand to my lips and inspect my wide mouth. There's blood on my fingers. Memories of violence swim in my mind, drowning in the boiling anger. Quiet down, please, Agnes says, scolding the young girls, now singing like a tempest. Their voices are everywhere, though, rebounding around the cafe like an echo I can't escape. Torturous. Accusatory. They're not just singing. They're singing to me. Have you heard of the Charnel Man? Whose face is split in two? The Charnel Man, the Charnel Man. He looks a bit like you. A voice whispers to me, beckoning me from within my own mind. It's smoother than glass and twice as sharp. And every word it speaks feels like a razor blade tracing along the inside of my skull. I am the light bringer, it says, and you are my torch. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Larry N50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajetti, Bert Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Kerry Harkonnen, Ladonis Bivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Wendy Burns, The Windigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gemstar, 
Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Eldridge Elm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, Casey Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Cloves Anoya Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brooke, The White Stag, Corgi Connection, No Name, Marta Cara, and Professor Elm. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos, a Discord channel, and bonus content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. It really does help out a lot. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.